Um, and now let's see, I should also be able to, yeah, okay, so now I have Matt's stream on my thing. Um, so whenever Matt's doing something, we will just switch to this scene and you'll be able to watch Matt do things on my stream um, and vice versa. So one of us is going to be doing something and then um, you'll all have it on all of the streams. So there's no need to have two streams open in parallel or anything like that. Sweet. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, since I restarted my computer, I've got like reauthenticated to a bunch of stuff. So give me just a moment and For I'll be sure. ready to go. But yeah. Yeah, I think I think MTU was the problem. So I, I was playing with my ten gig devices, and uh, I, oh, think and that, I think that I think that's what it was. Frames? Yep, I did. Ah. I you know it's it's so funny because I uh, I remember reading too. It's like oh you shouldn't do this unless you have a totally isolated storage network. And I'm like oh what's the worst that could happen? But ah, right. I guess I don't think I've Twitch streamed uh, since I did that. So uh, famous last words, yeah. Um, I do remember that um, it was interesting in uh, my university days when. Uh, Kabbalos was still more of a thing, right, for uh, authentication at universities especially. And mm -hmm. uh, Kabbalos was one of these protocols where it was extremely susceptible to MTU issues. So it could be that you had a misconfigured MTU or uh, DNS issues as well, and you would never notice until the one thing that doesn't work is your Kabbalos, because it was relying <laughs> on the packets to not be <laughs> fragmented for some reason. Um, so that was yeah. that was always the, the test case for this. Um, but you know, it's been so many years. Uh, I don't, I don't know anyone that uses Kerberos anymore. I think maybe one person. Yep, that sounds about right. It's, <laughs> right. So, it's so funny how much of a pain this stuff ends up being. Just yeah. uh, little tiny, little tiny things here and there. But as far as I can tell, everything is working well. Um, let me just. Oh, uh, Kerberos yeah. users are on the chat. Oh no, <laughs> we've angered them. <laughs> Still yeah, have nobody, a Kerberos realm. Uses, Slowly trying to deprecate. Nobody uses. Yeah. Nobody uses Kerberos, right? I actually thought about briefly like setting it up at home. I thought it'd be kind of fun, but I feel like that's also insane. You know? Yeah, um, um, I, I did actually do the whole thing. Like I did set up a Kerberos at my home uh, many years ago with the full like the full setup, right? You have like the one instance and then the failover, et cetera, like doing the full nine yards. Did you really? That's, that's wild. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm glad I don't run it anymore. <laughs> Right, for sure. It's like one of those things where it's it was it sounded fun, like in uh in theory at least, but mm -hmm. actually right. managing it on a day to day basis is hard. Okay, let me exactly. get my SSH exactly. FS mounts and everything set up. Cool. Um, let's cool. see here. Yeah, in the meantime, I'm gonna give people a little introduction. Um, yeah, please do. So, uh, we're gonna be using Go Crazy today, which is a pure Go user land for Raspberry Pi three and four appliances. Uh, the Raspberry Pi four support was actually added recently. Uh, we've added it on stream partly, so if you're curious about that, you can totally check out the recordings. Uh, the basic idea of Go Crazy is if you have a program that's written in Go and you want to run it on your Raspberry Pi, uh, it shouldn't be hard. It should be a single command. Uh, you shouldn't have to care about which Linux distribution you want to use on your Raspberry Pi. Do you want to use Raspbian? Do you want to install your own Fedora? Do you want to install Arch Linux? Whichever. How do you keep them up to date? Are you going to... Uh, do like you know maybe the NixOS version um, where you build images and then um, deploy them onto your Raspberry Pi, or um, are you just do you not care? Like th there's so, so many options here, so many such a large option space, right? Um, people have different trade-offs, people have different priorities. Priorities might change over time. Personally, I have noticed that uh, if a device doesn't have an automatic update story, it's not going to get updated realistically in the long run. Like maybe it gets updated. <laughs> In the first couple of weeks or so or whenever i have time um, but realistically it needs to be auto update um, and that's also you know part of you know one of the one of the bigger reasons why i started go crazy um, we can scroll down a little bit uh, to give you like an impression you have your apps and only four moving parts so in go crazy you have the linux kernel we're still using that of course you have the raspberry pi firmware files including the eprom files you have the Go compiler and standard library, of course, and then the Go Crazy user land. And that's all that ends up on your SD card. So there's no C software involved. There's no standard Linux distributions involved, no packages, no, no updates of that sort. Um, you just deploy the whole image and then uh, you update that, maybe from like a cron job on your workstation or something like that. And we're going to walk you all through that um, to build like a little demo program um, that's maybe also useful even. Um, Matt's going to share more about his use case. Um, let me actually catch up with the chat real quick. So while checking time of stream, I saw your tweet about changing SHA-256 to CRC. Find XX hash very good for non-crypto purposes. Thanks for the hit. Uh, thanks for the hint. Um, I think I did like I did run uh, like a little benchmark suite that did various Go hash algorithms. Um, and the CRC, sorry, CRC32 stood out specifically. 
uh, because it is hardware accelerated on the Raspberry Pi. And I think none of the others really are. Um, also, obviously, XX hash does more, I believe, than CRC, right? It's more involved computationally. So I'm not sure if um, I'm looking to change it to something else. The CRC32, as I've outlined in the tweet replies, is just um, as like an additional sort of sanity check or uh, defense in depth mechanism. Uh, it doesn't, like, it's not supposed to be cryptographically strong. We have other mechanisms for this, and it's not even the only checksumming device that we have. Um, so this is just another layer um, to to find and, and prevent quick mistakes. I know quite a big company is also slowly trying to deprecate their setup. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, certainly many of them out there, but I think I know what you mean. Uh, thanks to Matt's Netlink library, potentially could even run Docker containers with an entire Go user land Gawker, et cetera. Nice. Um, there is actually an open ticket in Go Crazy in the issue tracker about um, some sort of container story. Um, it hasn't moved in a while. Prompt even has an additional percent when I got a Kerberos ticket. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> why not? Um, for people who use Kerberos, it's certainly important to know when their ticket is valid and when it expires. Yeah, for sure. So how's it looking, Matt? How's your environment coming along? Uh, yeah, things are going pretty well. I'm just making sure I have everything up to up to speed and such. Um, I'm also tweeting things out late because we're... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, uh, let's see here. Let me just quickly yep. retweet your tweet. Doing the old, doing the old advertising thing a little bit. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, what a day! What a day! Yeah. So right now I've got you shared on my stream, so everything should be uh cool, pretty visible to folks. But yeah, um, if people on the chat have any questions about Go Crazy or you know anything about our setup, anything otherwise, just let us know. We'll try to um, address it as quickly as we can. For sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step away for just a sec. I need to get one more thing ready. Uh, yeah, one cool. moment. I'll be back. Cool. Yeah, I have uh, recently... Let me open up my, my Twitter feed here. Um, oh, come on. Um, can I click media? Oh, I can't view my media without logging in. That is annoying. But yeah, um, there's a couple of interesting things that I've done recently on Go Crazy. Uh, one thing that I just published today is a tool called STAT, which is kind of like DSTAT. Um, DSTAT is a great little tool. It produces output that kind of looks like this. So this is actually my clone, uh, the, the Go Crazy STAT tool, but it's very similar to what DSTAT would produce. And this allows you to like look at the uh, resources that your system is using uh, live in like a very aggregated fashion, right? Like you have all of these columns, but you have the nice colors and um, the, the different widths of the text to stand out. So I, I quite like looking at my system like that. Um, so now this is available in Go Crazy as well. The problem with DSTAT is that it's a Python tool. So it requires Python uh, and there is no Python on Go Crazy, right? I mentioned it's only Go. Um, so I had to like re-implement it uh, in Go, which is not too hard actually. Um, if only you want the bare minimum, right? But one little nice thing that I added as well is an HTML rendering of this. So uh, you can just look at this in the browser. You don't actually need to open up a terminal and SSH into your device. Um, you can just look at it from a separate port. Since the new kernel has WireGuard support, can WireGuard be used easily, especially for router seven to send some packets over WireGuard? Yeah, um, WireGuard support is one of the things that we want to work on. Um, not entirely sure if we will get around to it on this particular stream or in another stream. Um, yeah, WireGuard, I have used it successfully on Router 7 even uh, years ago even, right? Like I have run entire event networks with uh, 50 plus people over a WireGuard tunnel, um, both last year and the year before. Uh, works beautifully well. Um, it is... Uh, possible to do, but it's not necessarily easy and and like a well lit path uh, for you to follow along. But uh, that is one of the issues that we have in the issue tracker and that we're going to eventually address on stream. So uh, having like a good user story with good documentation for how to set up a WireGuard tunnel for one particular use case or another use case. Uh, cool. And then one other thing, um, let's see. Oh yeah, this is the one that I was looking for. I did recently verify that you can also run Go Crazy from a USB SSD. So there are these little USB sticks that kind of like blur the boundary between uh, is it a USB stick or an SSD. Uh, this one here uh, from SanDisk called the SanDisk Extreme Pro is available in two capacities, 128 gigs and 256 gigs. Um, 265 gigs, sorry. Um, and 
it's not so expensive, so 50 bucks, um, and it is super quick. Um, so now I bought one for my Raspberry Pi that I use for development, and is very nice because you have very fast update speeds. Uh, previously, I was just running them from an SD card. Um, so let me actually show you. Uh, yeah, so this like a little SD card right here. Um, the SD cards are nice uh, in that they are the most common setup and not all of the Raspberry Pis actually support uh, running from uh, USB or network. Um, some of them I think need newer firmware files and then you need to have the firmware files on the SD card, which is really awkward because then you suddenly need both the SD card and the USB stick. Uh, and if one of them dies, you're still kind of screwed. So the situation is better with the Raspberry Pi 4 because the Raspberry Pi 4 has all of the boot up code on an EEPROM. And on that EEPROM, like it persists even across restarts, right? So if you just want to update it to the latest boot code, you can just plug in an SD card once, run the update, and then uh, remove the SD card and switch to this uh, USB um, SanDisk stick, this one right here. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, this is pretty nice also because um, Go Crazy does EEPROM updates by default. So if uh, if you're looking to get into like a Raspberry Pi with Go Crazy from scratch and you have nothing else, you can just buy a Raspberry Pi, um, plug in your SD card once into your card reader, install Go Crazy on it, boot it up once, and then immediately switch to a USB stick. It's very simple. Yeah, I'm excited to play with this. It should be a lot of fun, actually. I uh, so my Raspberry Pi, I've been mostly migrating services away from it for a while because I'm using NixOS more and more. So yep. it's easy to deploy things that way, but. Yeah. Basically, um, I, my, my goal for today... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think you'll find that is just as easy to deploy things on Do Go Crazy. Uh, I mean, with a little bit different guarantees that you get, right? But uh, I think from the experience, it should be should be very pleasant. Mm -hmm. Certainly, yeah. I'm excited, though, because this will this will give me an excuse to play with Go Crazy for the first time. So I, I'm coming into the stream today just for, for folks who are watching. I'm coming into the stream totally blind, so we discuss whether or not I should learn this first. I know, like... There's the, the go crazy packer command and like it overwrites an SD card. And that's literally all I know. So right. we are going to be starting from zero, like building an application, hopefully that is somewhat useful. So I've got my Raspberry Pi 4. I've got a brand new SD card because I burnt out the other one somehow. Uh, it was showing up as a 30, 30 point something megabyte card, uh, which is, you know, problematic, of course, when it's a 32 gigabyte card. <laughs> so for sure. Uh, let's see here. I'm getting a request. Can we get Stoffberg audio a touch higher volume or empty layer mic a bit lower? Uh, I can turn my mic down slightly. Sure. One sec. No. I am not sure. Okay. So I reduced your volume on my stream as well. Say hi. Hello. I also just reduced my mic input uh, again. So I'm not sure if I'm at the right level or not. But... Cool. Um, can people in the chat say whether this is okay in both the Stapleberg chat and the Met Layer chat? Yeah, it's going to be difficult to coordinate because we both have our own independent OBS settings as well as our inputs. So exactly. I've got everything so that we're in theory at the same level right now, but our inputs just might be different levels as well. So Yeah, yeah. But hopefully we can make it work. Yeah, people say it's good on my stream. Okay, excellent. Matt is a little too quiet now. Oh, okay. Let me. Uh, uh, I'm not. I'm not really a quiet person. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I bumped him up a little bit again. Um, how is it now? Can you can you confirm in the chat, please? Uh, check check. So as far as I can tell, both of our audio levels are roughly at the negative ten to negative fifteen range, which is probably about as good as you can get without clipping. So yep. that seems like it's acceptable on my end, at least. Perfect. No, that's what people are saying. Perfect. Great. All right, very cool. Um, so how about um, I actually switch over to your picture um, and then you can show us some, um, oh, wow, this is a nice. Uh... <laughs> yeah, you'll get the cool little demo effect. Uh, one sec, sorry, I was typing. Uh, yeah. There we go, okay. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. this, is, this is pretty wild. So the way, the way we got this working is we have like essentially a little uh, Go scripted thing that's sending like an RT, RTMP or RTMP loop between the two of us. So we're actually, sending traffic directly to each other. And we have like virtual like video devices that we can use to inject each other's like desktops into our streams. So yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting day, but it should be fun. So yeah. as far as I can tell our, our, you know, we're not in the way, so that's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very cool. So how do we <laughs> want to start with this, Michael? Cool. Um, let me just very quickly get this chat question out of the way. Um, I did try it yesterday with the Raspberry Pi 3, but when I click on the application, I got 
um, executing header template at EEPROM, something that went wrong there. Yeah, we added the EEPROM support very recently. Maybe there's still a mistake somewhere. Um, I am pretty sure though that I did fix an issue that sounds sus uh, suspiciously like the one you're seeing very recently. So try updating everything to the li latest version. Um, if you can't make it work, please file an issue and uh, I'll be sure to follow up. This should be a quick fix. All right, um, so now let's get back to getting started here. Yeah, so um, what did you do with your Raspberry Pi yet? Like, where do you have the SD card? Is it connected to the network? Do we need to get all of that out of the way first? So I have a Raspberry Pi. I have an SD card with an adapter because micro SD is too hard to, you know, yeah. finagle with. Yeah. And I've got a thing plugged in. So basically, I'm going to start from zero. I think yesterday I might have, like, formatted the card, but that's it. So I okay. might have, like, installed, like, a new partition table. So. Yeah. Um, the partition oh, table will good. be wiped out by the Go Crazy Packer anyway, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to plug this in. Cool. And we will see where things go. Yeah. Why don't you open up the Quick Start page on in your browser? Um, okay, and sure. And that should give you like all of the commands to get started. So the structure that I recommend here is um, what we have in there. Uh, you have an instance variable, uh, which is a directory in your home directory. So you have a go crazy subdirectory and then you have one subdirectory per instance, right? So for example, in my, in my network, I have like four different instances here with four different devices. For you, it would be just one, but I recommend doing the directory structure anyway. Um, so like the first block of commands there to like do the mkdir, go mod in it, et cetera, maybe just run that. Um, maybe change the instance variable to something that is more descriptive of what your use case is or leave it at hello, we can always change it later. Yeah, so I think I actually ended up, um, I think I did something slightly similar with our setup here. So we have the SFTP directory. So basically Michael and I right now, instead of doing like VS Code live share today, we're trying an SFTP mount between our two computers. So uh, we live on opposite sides of the world, which would be pretty pretty interesting. But uh, so I actually did create a hello directory in here and a small Go mod. So I'm not sure if we're, uh, I'm not sure like if we're quite in the right setup or not, but I... Yeah, that this should work. Um, as long as okay. you have like a go.mod um, that is going to be used for your go crazy, that is all we need. Yep, there we go. Perfect. Um, so this is so where um, if you run the go crazy packer, it will fetch things from the internet, right? Like whatever packages you tell it, and those will end up in your go.mod. So you can use those files to actually version and have reproducible builds for everything, which is really nice, like a really nice side effect that we get from the go build model. Yep, so I think I did this yesterday as well, but I'm gonna go ahead and go get the Go Crazy Packer. Yep. This will add it to my Go mod, I assume. Uh, yeah, yeah, it should. Um, probably as an indirect, right? Uh, because these don't necessarily stick around, but that doesn't matter. Um, or maybe it doesn't... Oh yeah, there's the indirect, yeah, perfect. Yep, seems good. Cool. Hey, welcome um, folks, folks in my chat. So we have a pretty interesting little setup going on today. We are co-streaming with Stoppelberg. So uh, with any luck, this will work well. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Um, in my chat, people are asking, does Go Crazy work with Netboot? I haven't tried it personally, but it would be exciting to see. Um, I wouldn't know why it wouldn't work, but it might need like a little help here or there um, to like change a parameter or two. Um, if you're interested in investigating, um, please let me know on the issue tracker how this worked out for you. And then there's also saying if SFTP isn't fast enough, latency, et cetera, then maybe consider sync thing or similar. Yeah, for sure. Um, maybe we'll need to course correct um, with regards to the SFTP mode. But for now, we'll just try um, an easy uh, fix maybe for any sort of latency with the SFTP mode might be to just like R sync it over, um, you know, as we switch roles. So you would work locally, SFTP, sorry, R sync it into the SFTP, then I would pick it up from there, et cetera. But yeah, well, right. hey, we'll see. We'll just try for now um, how the SFTP goes. Um, and yeah. Right. So I noticed, actually, I should check the, uh, I should definitely check and make sure I'm not overriding the wrong device. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So here, here's a cool trick for this, right? So you know, um, you don't need to do the fdisk dance, right? So just do an ls-l on def slash disk uh, slash by dash star. Yeah. Cool. So now you have like oh, USB all, all of the paths, probably... right? Um, so right. identify the one that is your SD card and then choose the one that is the root of the device. So not a partition, but the actual device node. I'm pretty sure it's SDB1 here because my Kingston little hub here, I think, presents as like four different ATA devices as far yeah. as like the different ports. So I'm pretty you sure it's that. You can look SDB. at the timestamp also to see when you plug this in. Yeah, 1146, that sounds about right. Yeah, so uh, dev SDB, I'm sure is what it is. Perfect, so. so you can use actually the full path here, right? The dev disk um, by, what is oh, it, if you scroll up? And then just so use the like- Kingston. 
So this one right here? Yeah, exactly. But not the partition one, the, the one for your device actually, right? The whole device, the, yeah, yeah. So USB yeah. Kingston. Yeah, yeah, yep. exactly. Okay. Um, and then um, obviously also need the, the first bit, um, the dev right. disk file, uh, et cetera. I might have just removed that from my clipboard actually. <laughs> Oops. So <laughs> to, to clarify here, do we want to use this exact whole command or are yeah. we trying to put my module on here? No, so this, this is, this this is a good command to get started. Um, okay. We'll just adjust the device um, and then we'll iterate from there. So this would be uh, dev disk by, I guess I could just look it up really quick. So yep. uh, shoot. Yeah, this is the SFTP latency. Oh, yeah. Okay, so ls dev disk by ID Kingston. I don't know if it was by ID or if it was one of the others. Yeah, it looks like it USB was by ID, Kingston. USB Kingston. Cool. Uh, zero one, right? Yes, this is this is the one. So this is the one. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna copy. I'm gonna copy that. Uh, we'll put that over in the command line up above. Um, do we have to worry about like escaping the colons or anything here? Is that gonna no, be a problem? No, it's gonna be cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. So go crazy, Packer. Overwrite the Kingston device. Am I get to sudo this as well? Probably. You do not need to do that. Um, you can just run okay. this as your normal user, and it should ask you for privilege escalation as required. Okay. Uh, right, we are building. Nice. Let's see raw. What are you using my? What are you using that package for? Um. Oh, DHCP v4 most likely. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So it is fetching a bunch of stuff. Um. Yeah. There you go. So now it's asking you uh, to sue. So. It. Oh, okay, excellent. Uh, comment in my chat. It's confusing. Sometimes it's Matt, sometimes it's Michael who's working on the terminal. Yes, basically what's going to happen today is we are going to kind of trade back and forth depending on who is actively working. So at the moment, we're focused on kind of my machine. So Michael is sharing my screen essentially on his stream as well, along with his input. And if we're going to watch Michael do some kind of work, we will switch to my equivalent of that setup. So this is our attempt at making things less uh, chaotic <laughs> today. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, there we go. It appears to be writing a root file system. Yeah, nice. There cool. we go. Uh, okay. Let's see here. So now it's giving you a summary, right? There are a couple of things yes. uh, in there. So first of all, it's saying if you need to store persistent data, uh, one additional step is you'll need to create a file system. Because by default, you will only have like a root uh, read-only root file system. Um, aside from that, like you're good to go now, right? You could just unplug this SD card and boot it up if you're if you don't care about the persistent data. Um, we're going to care about this, but you know, if you're eager to get started, you can totally just uh, get started. Then yeah, it's giving you the... the URL for updating and for accessing the web interface. And lastly, yeah. it's telling you which outputs to expect. So by default, it will actually output to the serial console as the um, foreground Linux console. So some of the messages you will only see on the serial console, unfortunately, because of the way how Linux consoles work. Um, but right. you will also see a picture on HDMI. So if you, for example, and this is more the you as in talking to the general people on the stream, uh, if you only want to look at HDMI, I would recommend to disable the serial console because then you get all of the messages on HDMI and you don't need to worry about anything serial. But maybe the serial console is more convenient for your setup. So it really depends on your use case. But um, this is why the Go Crazy Packer is printing you this, this uh, sort of introduction and it's letting you know what it did and how you could change it. I didn't actually realize that the Pi had a serial console. Is that just like one of the pinouts? Like you can install like a serial, like a DB9 port or something on it? Exactly. And it even tells you in the message, right? It says 115K2 baud and pin 6, 8, and 10 for uh, ground TX and RX. Um, and if you nice. want to, if, if you're not familiar with the Raspberry Pi pinout, there is a website called pinout.xyz, which has all of the pins and their descriptions are very nice. Good to know. So I don't have the, I don't think I had the gear today for the serial console. I could do HDMI, but we wouldn't be able to get it on stream. So I think in theory, the web interface should be sufficient, right? Like if yeah, I plug this sure. in, I, I know the, I know the host name this will come up with as because I've got it hard coded in my DHCP server essentially. So. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, it also sends a host name, right? So you can see that in the URL, it says go crazy. So that's the default host right. name. You can later change it and it will definitely use that host name to, um, request a DHCP lease. So if you have local resolution working on your network, you should be able to just use like ping go crazy, for example. Yeah, I think the thing is right now is like, since I'm using uh, ISC, DHCP and core DNS, like does they don't think they interoperate at all. So at the moment I have it so that 
this device with this MAC address will give be given a spec or this MAC address will be given a specified name, and it also goes in the core DNS through like a templating thing. So I know the host name will come up with this. I just need these credentials okay. basically. Okay. So cool. Uh, yeah, I guess I will. I can plug this in, and we can see if this works. Yeah, yeah, so, for sure. Do I need to do anything like unmount the? I don't need to unmount no. this. It's already just done. No, you can really unplug okay. and replug now. Okay, so I have my SD card. Uh, no, no magic here. So. <laughs> I'm going to take this, I'm going to pull it out, put it in the Raspberry Pi, and I will go plug it in over in the little spot where I have the power supply and such for it. Um, let's see here. <laughs> okay, people on the chat so are it's saying, kind of funny, so... can you use two different terminal background colors to give viewers a hint who is currently working? Um, I think that you'll see it in, like, you know, which programs are open. Um, Matt's using Visual Studio Code. I'm going to be using Emacs. Um, but for now, it's just going to be Matt. We're going to say it uh, clearly when we switch over. So don't yep, worry about it. we definitely it. will. Um, and also, I'm looking uh, okay, so. pale in comparison, apparently. So that's just how it is. Sorry, that's the lighting in my room. <laughs> yeah, I got a, I got the Elgato key light fancy thing. Um, oh, yes, now I have my, I've got my Raspberry Pi. I've got my SD card installed. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in really quick. One sec. Maybe this is better. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Okay, so this is going to be interesting. See if it comes up uh, first try on the network. Um, the suspense is going to be long. Typically, the Raspberry Pi used to start up pretty quickly, like the Pi 3, I think. It could start up in something like 10-ish seconds. Um, but the Raspberry Pi 4 actually takes longer to start up. Um, so I was just saying the Pi 3 was actually quick to start up. The Pi 4 takes longer. Uh, I think the Pi 4 takes up to 30 seconds or so. So if you've just plugged it in, um, it might take a little bit of time until it comes up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is the host name I've got the setup as. So whenever the whenever it starts pinging, assuming oh, that so it you're comes counting up with... on it actually uh, accepting an IPv6 address, right? Oh, I Which can do. I can, do, I can force. Okay, yeah. I can force dash v. Yeah, oh, there we cool. go. So okay. see, it, it came up. So. Nice, nice. Yeah, I've got it set up so I can do both v4 and v6 because some of my devices are dumb and don't support v6. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Out of curiosity, can you test if v6 already works here? Uh, sure it does yeah. work nice very good okay excellent uh so a couple a couple questions in my chat will we see go's new feature today generics no i don't believe so so we are focused on the go crazy stuff today uh we will probably i'll probably do a generic stream at some point but not today so apologies uh let's see here uh the pins the pinouts are not rs232 you need a level converter okay good to know um yeah i don't have any of those devices today so yeah so you were saying a db9 serial port right and that i think is why the person clarified uh, with yeah, I don't levels, I don't know right? anything about serial, so I'm probably the wrong yeah. person to ask about this sort of thing. Yeah, the Raspberry Pi serial port is uh, what's called a UART port, so it is like on the lower voltage levels and not like the proper serial port 12 volts or something. But that is what most people are using when they say serial nowadays, right? Like a USB to serial adapter will just be UART or compatible, so don't worry about it. Um, just just connect it, a couple of jumper wires right. or something. So this just worked. This is this is like magic. Yeah, for sure. So now you can see a couple things here, right? Um, so first of all, like if you scroll up um, to the very right, you can see that uh, you know to circle back to the to the question earlier on my Twitch chat, um, the EEPROM stuff seems to work. Um, so maybe maybe it's solved by updating. Um, anyway, um, then uh, you can see on the left top side uh, you have a version number. So this is the build timestamp. You can always use this to verify that what you just did in the terminal is actually reflected on the device, right? If an old version comes up there, something went wrong. Um, then uh, on the on the top right again, you have the host name. Um, as we mentioned, this is go crazy by default. Um, you can change it easily to something more descriptive later, and you'll see the model that you're running on. A couple of models are uh, supported by Go Crazy. We have the Raspberry Pi version three and version four, and you can also run it on the PC Engine's APU series or probably any other PC platform that you have. We're testing it with the QMU in the x86 64 mode in our continuous integration. So anything that boots like QMU boots which should be all of the PCs, roughly, um, should work just fine. Yeah, and then uh, you have a bunch of services cool. here, um, and right. memory and storage. We already talked about storage a little bit, and then you have network addresses. Uh, network addresses is like separated into private and public network addresses. Um, by default, the Go Crazy interface will be available on the private network interfaces only. Um, but mm -hmm. there is also an option to enable TLS, at which point maybe public network interfaces become an option for you. 
Um, is it TLS using like Let's Encrypt as well? Or? No, it's not using Let's Encrypt. It's using self-send certificates by default um, because it's not assuming that you necessarily have like, you know, public reachability and public uh, host names for your devices. Right. Um, there are some setups where that is not the case. Um, and then the, the storage up there, um, that is what we already talked about earlier, right? So currently you cannot save anything on this particular installation, which might be fine, right? If the only thing you want to do is have some stateless services, for example, like an IRC bot or something that just replies to commands, um, that might be good enough. But uh, pretty sure we're going to want to create a file system here so that we can store things. For example, one of the things we're going to set up is the break class service so that we can iterate more quickly. Um, but actually looking at the services, you can see a bunch of processes, right? And you can see the last log line of each. And if you click on the name of any of them, you will see even more details. So in here, that's the DHCP client. You can see standard out and standard error. Um, all of them log. They log what I hope to be the right amount, you know, just a little bit so that the last log line is always useful, uh, but also enough that you can see what's going on and if there's any trouble. In the module info, you can see the, the versions of the modules that went into your build. Um, just in case there's some question, you know, if you're picking up an old Raspberry Pi after a couple of month, uh, months or weeks or years even, uh, you might be wondering what software is running on there. So uh, you can always look at the build timestamp, of course, but if you can no longer reproduce the image, it might be good to know exactly what's running on there to see if you need to update it first to address a security issue or no. Uh, Very yeah, cool. that's pretty much the, the introduction to the web interface. Um, that's also pretty much everything you can do in this web interface, right? Um, but uh, let me walk you through a couple of processes, actually. Uh, so NTP is required because the Raspberry Pi doesn't have a real-time clock. So it cannot right. retain the time across different boots. Uh, so that's why we always need to set the clock. So that's why it comes with an NTP client by default. Then if you go back, um, there are more processes. There's the DHCP process, which is just a DHCP4 client. Um, that is what obtained the IP address that we use to ping it. And then we have the random D, which is responsible for both persisting and restoring a random seed if you had a writable partition um, across restarts so that you have more entropy when the system boots up. Um, so we're not going to worry about the error message that prints for now. That is expected as you don't have the partition created yet. And then right. if you go back, um, I think that that was all the system services. Yeah, you can see the distinction based on the path uh, of the service, right? Everything in slash go crazy slash is part of the go crazy system. And everything that is slash user slash is user provided programs. We can see that we have two programs that we provided on the command line here. We have the hello program and the serial busybox uh, program. Uh, serial busybox is uh, what it says on the tin, right? It is a version of busybox that is um, made available on the serial port. So if you were to actually connect the USB to serial now, you would be able to have a shell on there for debugging. But um, we, we don't have that, so we might as well remove the package in uh, future invocations of the go crazy packer command. Um, but sure. if you go back to the hello program, you can see that um, it will just loop forever and print hello world. That's what it does. So it is restarted nice. by go crazy all the time. right? You can see the attempt counter is going up um, because it's kind of failing, so to say, because it's exiting. So you can see the, the supervision model is pretty simple, but it's good enough for all of the things that I need to do with it. Um, and yeah. this confirms that you now have code running on this device, right? And now you can like have your own repository, start your own package, and then deploy it onto the onto the Raspberry Pi. Um, and for that, I would recommend like, do you have any questions right now? Or ah, uh, no, not at all. This is this is very cool. It's really nice how this is a nice little integrated environment. So I think that uh, what I read on your website about like not wanting to manage things like a kernel and everything on a Raspberry Pi really resonates with me. Like yeah. this device kind of. Uh, you kind of just set it and forget about it. And like, I would log into it once in a while. Uh, so the, for example, my, my use case for everyone here is I have my server running over there, my desktop running here. They both have serial consoles over USB, USB to serial adapters. And I use the Raspberry Pi as a way to SSH into that and open serial consoles in case I like break networking on my server um, because I use cheap consumer gear. <laughs> so the goal would be to possibly build an application using Go Crazy, which allow us to uh, SSH into a given port or something and open up a serial connection to one of my devices. So this seems very cool. It's nice because I don't really care about the Raspberry Pi. It's like, you know, I don't want to manage an entire system. Like its job is to be an appliance. And I think that's exactly what Go Crazy is for, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, very cool. So I guess the one, one question here is this is looping forever and writing these logs. Is this like uh is this like writing to the file system or to like a ring buffer? Or? It is a ring buffer in memory, yeah. There's no uh, okay. persistent file system going on by default at all. Like you really need to right. create that before anything happens on the disk. 
Excellent. Yeah, because I know, for example, I've, uh, you know, with bad configurations of things like, you know, spammy system D services or et cetera, I've worn out a few SD cards. So <laughs> For sure. Yeah, that is like the number one problem of using uh, embedded devices. I've seen it, you know, 20 years ago with uh, CF cards, SD cards, et cetera, like anything that is sort of a flash card um, that has wear leveling, uh, you need to be careful to not write it out. And that is exactly why we default to everything being read-only. Um, it really helps uh, give the devices a long life. For sure. Uh, so we have a couple questions in my chat really quick. So what are you going to run on the RPI? I think my goal is, you know, this SSH to serial thing and possibly you mentioned also it'd be easy to run a Prometheus exporter and now you have many. Yes, I'd probably run like the node exporter just to monitor the system itself. I saw there was something on the website about running node exporter. I'd be curious to see how that goes. That would be something I'm very interested in doing. Um, and in addition, is there Docker support? I Is there Docker support for this? I guess I'm not even sure what that would mean in this context. But Yeah, I think what people mean when they ask is, uh, are you able to run Docker containers on your Go Crazy Raspberry Pi? Uh, the answer right now is no, not easily. But there is an open issue for it. And if people are interested, you could just check that out and see where things stand. Um, I think there was a person who was interested in contributing something, but then didn't seem to work out. Um, so maybe just asking politely on that issue where things stand and whether you can help in any way is the right thing to do here. Excellent. In general, I should note though that uh, from a philosophical perspective, right, the idea really here is to have everything in Go. Um, so if like, you know, if you have a thing in Go, you wouldn't need a Docker container. And if you need a Docker container, your thing is most likely not in Go. So, you know, um, it, of course, you're free to ignore my philosophy, right? I'm just saying that, you know, the, the purpose of the system was a different one. So keep that in mind. Excellent. Cool. Um, so I would say the next step now is uh, complete the setup by um, plugging out the SD card again, like powering off your Raspberry Pi, plug out the SD card, mm -hmm. put it back into your host. Um, do that MKFS command that it has here on the, on the site for you, right? Uh, in the storage section, the mkfs.x4 command, that is supposed to be run on your computer. Sure, I can do that. Uh, so one question, I don't need to gracefully shut this down in any way, I can just pull the power? That is correct, yeah. Okay, excellent, I'll be back in one sec. Yep. I have an idea. I would like to uh, bring this closer to my desk so I can uh, we can do this more easily. So let me really quick just try and plug something in and get a longer Ethernet cable. I have one right here. So sure. Me be yeah. Long. yeah. Are there any requirements on the Go programs that we can install on Go Crazy? Um, there are some direct and some indirect requirements. Uh, in principle, you can install any Go program. The question is whether by default it will do something useful. Like if you were to just say, I don't know, you know, if you, if you were to run an ls command and you were to install it as a daemon, it would certainly list the directory, right? But then, you know, it would just do that in a loop. So that's not going to be very useful. Uh, the, the programs, like if you have a server program, then if it starts up by default with the default flags, you can totally just put it onto go crazy, install it, and it should just work. Um, if that program has any sort of runtime dependencies, like if it requires dbus or anything else that needs to run on your system, that will most likely not work, right? Because on Go Crazy, nothing is running except for the few processes that you've seen here on the screen. Um, so maybe, you know, if you had a couple of specific examples, we could walk through them and then maybe give you a better idea like that. If I remember correctly, Go Crazy Packer generates a main.go for init. Why is that necessary? It's not strictly necessary, and you can actually provide your own init function if you want to, um, but it's certainly a convenient default, right? Because the default is, uh, the, the generated init will just automatically supervise all of the programs that you specify in terms of Go packages on the command line. Um, so that is typically what people want to do. So which is why this is the default, right? And only if you like decide to have your own code around the supervision, like if you need special care of booting in some way or something, then you would probably inject your own uh, init file. What do you have running on your Raspberry Pis? Um, yeah, I have a bunch of stuff running on them. Um, 
I can actually walk through this, um, but I would like to walk through it when everybody can see. So that would mean when Matt's back and we can switch the scenes. Um, so we'll just, um, we'll answer this question in just a sec. What does a test setup look like when you develop this? Copy updated binaries to a file system on the Pi. So the exciting answer to this is you're going to see how this looks like. Um, and we're going to move from, uh, step by step, we're going to move from where we are right now, where Matt needs to stand up and physically change cables and SD cards, um, to a very convenient setup where um, you know we can just like actually start a program there um, via SSH. Oh, sorry about that. Let's step away for just a sec. Yeah, no worries. I was just answering a couple of questions in the chat while you were doing that. Um, there's one for which we should uh, switch our uh, stream scenes so that I can show things. Um, so if you wanted to do oh, that yeah, while you get ready. Yep, you got it. There you go. Cool. Um, Ooh, let trippy. me actually... <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so here we go. So you should be able to see my screen now. Um, on gocrazy.org, there is a showcase. Um, where you can see a bunch of software that was written specifically for Go Crazy or successfully tested to run on Go Crazy. Um, let me walk you through a couple of them. Uh, one of the original ones um, that I started out with is a rather specific one, though uh, you can probably relate. It's sort of a little bit of home automation. Um, and for a while I was using an AB receiver with a couple of inputs and outputs and you would need to switch it um, to the correct source and it would automatically look at what sort of things were happening in the network and then automatically figure out which source was the intended source um, and what outputs need to be connected and what volume levels need to be adjusted. And then it would coordinate all of that. So for example, if you were to come home and you would just start casting uh, YouTube onto the Chromecast, um, the program running on the Raspberry Pi would detect this because it can detect programmatically that the Chromecast is playing something. And then it would automatically power on the TV and the receiver and the uh, sound system and stuff like that. Um, so that sort of orchestration is great to run on a Raspberry Pi, right? Because the Raspberry Pi consumes very little power um, and you have a lot of compute to do sort of even very complicated things. Um, so that's that. I have a similar system for SSH-based backup that I do. Um, I have even more home automation stuff um, specifically uh, I wonder if I have like a screenshot. Oh yeah, a screenshot of the Grafana here. This is like more interesting than uh, the GitHub main. Um, so uh, in the screenshot here, you can see the metrics, the Prometheus metrics that I'm putting into Grafana from my home automation central control unit implementation. So it turns out that I have these, uh, let me see, um, Homematic is the name of the devices that I have. Um, they do things such as, uh, Maybe, maybe this one. Oh, come on. All right, uh, can we make this really large? No, no larger than this. Okay, so they have, for example, um, various sensors. I don't actually know most of them, I have to say, but the typical ones like valve drives for your heating, um, you have sensors to detect whether windows are open or closed, you have switches to control uh, lights, etc. So the typical home automation stuff, um, and the problem with the homematic devices in the older revision was that the control unit that they had was actually really bad. Like it was the slowest web interface that I had ever used um, to the extent that you click on one thing and you wait five seconds for it to load. Um, and this was because <laughs> it was a way underpowered embedded device and it was running this hefty Java software. And it was so bad that every couple of days it would actually run out of memory and the web interface would just not come back up. Uh, so in the beginning, I added like a, a reboot to my cron tab just to keep the device working, but then I was just so unhappy with it that I ended up re-implementing the entire thing in Go um, and I'm running it on Raspberry Pi. So that was like a nice uh, nice project to like figure out how all of that sort of stuff worked and then come up with my own re-implementation. Um, but the nice bit is that now I actually have like Prometheus metrics, right? Um, and like, if you look at the memory usage of my implementation, 10 megabytes uh, of, of resident set size, which is way better than what the original implementation did. But you know, of course, mine does, does less. Right. 
Um, cool. cool. Let me just very quickly cover the others and then we'll get back to it. Um, so scan to drive is like you have a scanner, you get a letter uh, by mail, like snail mail, right? You want it on your cloud. Um, scan to drive helps you with this. Um, then beatbox is like a children's toy that somebody built, um, not by me actually, very cool. Also based on go crazy. And then obviously router seven, um, the small home internet router that we might also be working on today, um, is also built on the go crazy platform, but not running on the raspberry Pi itself. I mean, it can run on the raspberry Pi, but I don't run it on the raspberry Pi. I run it on a better machine on the PC engines, APU. Um, and then successfully tested the Prometheus um, node exporter, Prometheus itself, black box exporter, Grafana, etc. All of this can be run, but may require additional setup. Um, and we might actually get into this today. Um, so now that was like the, the showcase of things that um, I do with my devices, largely. Um, and now let's get back to Matt Lair's stream. So I'm going to switch over to the OBS scene so that we can see Matt's screen again. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, let us know where you are now. Uh, yeah, so basically I got to the point where I now have the Raspberry Pi sitting on my desk. Uh, there we go. Yeah. We have longer cables and such. Uh, cool. I have just plugged the SD card, unplugged it from the Raspberry Pi, is now plugged back into my computer. Mm -hmm. I have the device here, and I basically was just copying and pasting yeah. the MakeFS command from the web interface. So Perfect. So if I run this, uh, I would assume that this will... Yeah, you need to sudo it. I need... Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we're going to build We're gonna build the permanent file system using ext4 on the SD card. So Exactly. Yeah, so this is going to take a little while depending on how big your SD card is. I think you mentioned yours is 64. 60, 64 gigs. Yeah. Yeah, so funny funny story. Uh, so I, a couple days ago, I realized my SD card was burnt out. I think I mentioned this earlier as well. My SD card, oh, it didn't take long. Um, my existing SD card, the one I was using here, was having problems. So I went to Best Buy yesterday, which is a store here in the U.S., and I... Was t I talked to my friend who works there, and I'm like, you know, what's the smallest SD card? He's like, you know, pretty much like 32s, but they're all out of stock. And so 64 was the option. So I got like a SanDisk, like Extreme Plus 64 gig SD card for like 20 bucks. So it is amazing how cheap uh, flash memory has become. So this is way, way overkill, but it's just the easiest thing I could find on like a day's notice. So because Amazon wasn't going to show up until Monday. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually got like a bunch of uh, SD cards recently. Um also very similar, I think, also SanDisk ones. Um, but mine are 16 gigs because that's what um, our shops have here. Um, and already like 16 is already so much more than I could ever need for these, right? Like realistically, uh, a four gigabyte one would be fine. Totally. So I, I will probably go ahead and buy some some backups and stuff. And like, I suspect that, so usually what happens is I discover something like this. And now I realize like how easy it is to like do this. And I'm probably going to end up with like five different Raspberry Pi appliances for my apartment. Yeah. Uh, automating various things. So <laughs> I know how it goes, a, man. <laughs> exactly. This is this is a rabbit hole. And I find myself liking where this is going because I don't have to care about things like the kernel. I just care about putting my apps on there. You know, exactly. Which is perfect. Exactly. So. Great. Uh, yeah, okay. so we're at the point now where we have the SD card formatted. Should I put it back in the Raspberry Pi? Um, wait one sec. Um, so one thing that yes. we're also going to set up now um, Though actually like, okay, so um, somebody was asking on chat earlier, right? Like what does a test setup look like when you develop this? So um, we're gonna walk through like all the steps of the way. So what we've currently done is we have written onto the SD card and booted up the Raspberry Pi for the first time. What we now could already do actually, but we didn't, is uh, we could update Go Crazy via the network, right? We could run the Go Crazy Packer and instead of telling it to override an SD card, we could tell it to update over the network. Now we didn't do this because before we do uh, the regular development, one thing that we wanted to do is create the permanent data partition, which we just did. And then one more thing that we're gonna install right away uh, for prototyping is called break glass. Um, and that is, uh, if you pull up a browser and you go to github.com slash go crazy slash break glass, all one word. Exactly. So break glass is sort of an escape hatch for the model of go crazy um, because on go crazy, everything is read only static, right? Um, and break glasses idea is for prototyping. You want the exact opposite, right? You want ephemeral, uh, uh, but read write storage that you can execute binaries in, etc., and poke around in the system. So that's what break glass mm -hmm. is. It is uh, an SSH slash SCP server where you can install your own environment very quickly. Um, and yeah, so you're doing the right thing here. You're you're modifying the go crazy packer command line to include break glass. We're gonna do that, but one more thing that we need to do is uh, uh, the one thing that it says below, right? Where you mount the permanent partition 
you create an SSH host key for the device and you install your own public key as an authorized key so that you can SSH in afterwards. Um, so why don't you go ahead and do actually, these two? Yeah, we'll do. I'm not actually familiar with the install command. What does this do? Right. It's sort of a better version of CP, so to say. It just copies the file oh, run, okay. but you can also give it a mode, uh, which we do here, M600. So we have read write for the owner, but then no access permissions for anyone else. Um, you can do this. Um, install has one other uh, interesting like side effect, uh, which is that when a binary is already running on your computer, um, if you try to use CP, it would try to unlink your program and then tell you that the program, the, the text file is already in use, I think is the error message you'll be getting. But if you used install, it would actually replace the thing in place um, and in a way that is compatible with running the program at the same time. So if you ever run into the case where you need to update a program, but you also don't want to terminate it, uh, use the install command instead of CP. That's uh, that's very useful, actually. So good good to know. It's kind of funny. I've been using Linux for, you know, coming up on 11 years now or something, and I had no idea what that was until just now. So thank yeah. you. Um, I think you would come across it more in a packaging context, right? Because build systems, make files, and the like um, is where you would use install more than interactively. Oops. So crazy. Packer. Maybe in your uh, right. terminal at the top. I think you're right, yeah. Uh... Uh, one thing that I find useful is uh, to just plug that whole go crazy Parker command into a make file and just like the make file can just literally yeah. be three lines, right? Just the all target and just put the command in there because you're going to modify it so much that if it lives in your shell history, it's it might get messy. Uh, it's cleaner right. to just put it into the make file to begin with. Right. Um, somebody on chat also mentioned installed stats too. Yeah. Um, I was telling people earlier, I'm not sure if you were around, I think you might have... Uh, been away during that time that there is now a cool little stats thing um and yeah, we're gonna add actually. this as well uh to your command line um so that we can observe it um sure. play around with it sure so go crazy uh break glass yeah um and oh, stats. we don't want serial busy box. oh yeah the serial, serial busy box, box you can remove um the stats one uh, the path for it will be uh, go crazy slash stat slash cmd slash dot 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 I think I think that should work um, it should give you both of the programs uh, one of them is going to be uh, a web server daemon um, that will serve the output via HTML and the other one is going to be like a program that you know it doesn't start up as a daemon but it will be available for you to use via break glass excellent okay um, so cool we got the yeah. make file now um, that looks good uh, so you should be able to just run make um, and then yeah that should be it are we missing a no we haven't we haven't actually mounted the permanent storage yet okay let's see what happens so Oh, I think you need to mark it as phony. Yeah. Uh, that phony. Right? Yep. I'm really bad at make files. Yeah, but... no worries. Um, that should hopefully be all the make file we need for today. Huh. Um, is your tab stuff correct in there? Probably not. Like, no. before the go crazy packer, it should be exactly one tab. Yeah. And then below, it should also be exactly one tab, and that should work. Yep. Okay. Let's try it again. All there right, we go. There we go. Ah, make. <laughs> Gotta love it. Yeah, very cool. Uh, okay, no so packages. that match no packages. Oh, yeah, because they're not downloaded yet. Um, oh, so we need to use full names here. So instead of the cmd slash dot dot dot, just use uh, cmd slash um, go crazy. So just a G-O-K-R prefix, G-O-K-R dash uh, webstat. One word. Yeah, try this. Okay. Let's bring this back down a ways. Mm-hmm. Cool. Very cool. This feels like uh this feels like so easy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That that is certainly what I was going for. It should be easy, right? It yeah. should be easy to just run your Go programs on your Raspberry Pi. Yeah. It's like I don't care about all these other things, just make yeah. it work. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um okay, so let's so have... let's do the permanent data partition also, right? And then afterwards we no longer need to uh deal with the SD card physically, right? We'll be able to just do right. everything over the network. Right, okay. Um, so we already had the partition created, right? Yeah. Just need to mount it now. So, okay. Um, let's see here. So sudo mictor, uh, no, not mictor, uh, mount dev sdb. You can just copy paste oh, like from the path that it gives you on, on the mkfs command in there. Oh, okay. Yeah, dev disk by. Yep. So we've already for formatted this. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yep. That's the one. 
mount temp. Ah, shoot. Temp, right. Ah, shoot. I can just create that. Yeah. Vector mount uh, temp. Something like that. Yeah. Thought we would have had that for sure, but. All right, okay. Cool. Uh, mount temp. And now we have the ext4 partition with nothing in it, right? Exactly. So we now need the, these commands. So yeah. we, cre we create a host key and mm -hmm. we install. So so I've got these two separate windows. Do we need sudo? Um, yeah, in order for, for you to write onto the mount, right? Oh, writable. Yeah, make it writable. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. because the, the permanent data partition is owned by root, right? Um, and we want to keep it that way. Right. Right. Uh, so we are using an RSA host key. I assume that's fine. Yeah, should be fine. I think uh, we should be able to just flip that to uh, ED as a DSA or what was what is it called? Um, ED two five five one nine. Yeah, yeah. But let's leave it at RSA for now um, and do okay. the ED maybe <laughs> in a later step. Understood. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Cool. And install. Install your authorized keys. Yeah. Yes, and in this case, I have an SSH key specifically I will use. So cool. uh, let's yep. see here. So break glass to authorize keys, right? Mm -hmm. MD layer ED25519. There we go. Is that uh, your dot pub? Sorry. Wait, is that the dot pub? No, th that's no yeah, you're Needs right. To be oh, dot pub. You're right. Yep. Yep, good call. Good call. Almost installed my private key. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to good. like burn the SD card right after, right? Uh, maybe you would never paste. be able to get it off again. <laughs> right. All right, uh, cool. Paste yeah. that random art into chat paste the random art into chat for verification purposes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> people people trolling me in my own chat. Okay, yeah. there we go. Cool. Um, now, All right. Now we have the public key. Yeah, you can unmount it now. Uh, maybe run a sync for good measure afterwards, just to be sure everything is fleshed out to any disks. And it shouldn't be necessary, but okay. who knows? Um, unmount first. Temp. Yep. Okay. Cool. Uh, in theory, now I can just pull the SD card and put yeah. it back in the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, do it. Ta da. Yeah, micro SD are convenient, but they're just so small. I have a hard time messing with it. So just putting it in a full size SD adapter is just easier, you know. Yeah, I don't even see where the full size SD card is though on my Pi Four. Does it even have one? Uh, oh, no, you only no, have so it for I, uh, when you put it into your computer. You mean? Correct. Ah. No, so I have a, I've got like a, a, a reader here that has like four different slots and stuff. But the mic, I always like have a hard time fiddling with micro SD cards, so it's easier for me to just use this temporarily. Oh, gotcha. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, so the Raspberry Pi is plugged in. I will now power it up and see what happens. Cool. So this should come right back up on the network. Yeah, uh, ping. you can run the ping already. Yep. I guess I could have just done the dual stack address, but... Yeah, I mean, either way. Mm -hmm. So I just found out Stoffelberg is the man who made i3 possible. Yes, Stoffelberg is the creator of i3. Yep, that's me, hello. Cool. He is my personal hero now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's written some pretty cool software for sure. All right, there we go. Cool. Pinging, so, uh, so check back into the web interface. Let's see what we see yep. now. Nice. All Pretty right. Um, so you can now see in the storage, right? It now shows you the file system details, right? It says 57 gigs right, total. Yeah. So that has worked. Um, yep. Also, we no longer have the serial busy box as expected. And we do have the user break glass process and the user go crazy web stat. Um, so why don't we do the go crazy website first because it's nice and simple and should work out of the box <laughs> um, and the break glass right after. Um, so the web okay, stats, so... you should be able to just open like port 6618 on that device in a separate tab oh, I see. and get something. Nice. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh... yeah, that is it. So if you've used these stats before, that should be very familiar to you, the, out the output here. Um, yeah, you can see a bunch of stuff, right? So from left to right, this is CPU usage. Then you have uh, disk read write, um, interrupts and context switches, network receive and send, and then memory usage. Uh, so this is all of the important dimensions that you need um, when you're like getting a hang of the performance characteristics of some program that's running on your Pi. Nice, very cool. All right, definitely, yeah. uh, definitely easier for prototyping than Prometheus metrics for sure. You know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> More real time too. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is like a nice little aside, um, just to show you what this looks like. Um, but like the real interesting bit now is both the network updating and the break glass, right? 
Yes. Um, so let's do the break glass first um, and then do a network update right after just for the heck of it. So break glass okay. by default, um, you can see that in the log, it says process should not be supervised stopping, right? And this is because the process exited with exit code 125, which is sort of a special sentinel error exit code that we use in Go Crazy so that you can tell the init system that you know this program should be started on demand only and not all the time. This is important mm -hmm. for break glass because it's supposed to be like, you know, it's it's tearing open a hole into your security model, right? So it's supposed to only run whenever you're actually developing on like a throwaway Raspberry Pi and not be open by default in steady state operation on all of your important devices. So that's why by yep. default it's stopped, right? So we'll need to click restart um, and then we should be seeing a log output on standard out as well after you actually reload that tab. Um, if you restart it, it will actually do like another render of the output um, immediately, right? So it will show you that the process was restarted, but it hasn't had a chance to output anything yet, which is why you need the extra reload, right? Because it takes a little bit of time for the program to actually print something. But now you'll see Excellent. that so it is... has all of the listeners, right? It has an SSH listener. It gives you the SSH host key fingerprint even so that you can verify that the connection you're about to make is actually authenticated correctly. Right, because I previously had Ubuntu or Debian, Raspbian installed on this. This is going to have a different fingerprint. Yeah. So... It will, exactly. SSH will do the freak out thing it does, you know. Yeah. Um, why don't you try just SSHing into it? Um, it will not give you a successful session, but you'll be able to verify, yeah, yep. and remove your keys, etc. Right. Cool. Yep. Uh, yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. This is pretty much what we expect at this point. Um, this might seem okay. a little bit weird, right? Like you SSH into it, but nothing happens. But this is because you haven't yeah. copied an environment into it yet, right? So I was mentioning that um, break glass actually uh, allows you to bring your own environment, so to say, right? Um, there is actually also a tool um, which will do like this whole dance of starting break glass and then copying your environment to it and then SSHing into it. Um, and you can find that one in the break glass repository under command. Um, but for now, let's focus on doing it manually with just SCP and SSH. Um, so let's see, um, we do have like, we do have an example here, but I don't think we actually give you like a full tarball that you could use. So I think we'll need to construct one together um, as okay. you can see yeah. here, right? Um, in the instructions. One thing that you can steal though, um, because it's a bit fiddly to get right and not the purpose of the stream is the BusyBox binary um, already mm -hmm. pre-compiled. And you can grab this out of the serial busybox repository. So if you go to github.com slash go crazy serial busybox, um, that's where you'll find that binary. Yeah, and if you click on third okay. party busybox 1311, yeah, that is the binary you'll need. So just download that somewhere. Yep. So this is like for uh, compiled for ARM64. So this will run on the Raspberry Pi. Um, mm, it is C code actually, um, but statically compiled. There we go. Okay, cool. so it's okay. there. So we're so we're switch back this. to the other tab because that contains the command yeah. that you'll need to create a tarball, and then we'll arrange everything in place. So yeah, so just do essentially everything that it says here, right? Um, starting at the third command. So you'll want to create a symbolic link to BusyBox that is just called sh. You can also rename BusyBox to sh if you prefer. Either way, it needs to be called sh to be the default shell. Okay, uh, let me, I should probably move this into, do I need to put this in a certain place? Or um, no, do I need to move this file? Not particularly. We can, I would recommend to just put it into your go crazy directory right next to where you have the other instance stuff like the go.mod file okay. from earlier. Oh, now you're copying it onto my uh, SFTP. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. I don't know so where it is. It <laughs> just takes a little while. Cool. Yep. It's a bit slow, but it's not bad. Okay, so link done. Uh, now we have the tar cf break glass tar. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we're creating the break glass tar ball with the shell. Exactly. Is the goal. Yep. And then the next step will be to just SCP that break glass the tar onto the device. So literally just, and it's not in there because it's using the wrapper program. So, but we're going to do it manually just okay. so that people can see what this is really about. Onto the. Yep. Just like that. Exactly like that. Cool. And now try an SSH again. Oh, shoot. Uh, 
Uh, oh, maybe without the shared connection. I don't know. Uh, dash capital S. Oh, yeah, I think you. Yes, yeah, it's just HCM. Yeah. Oh, it's logging as Matt as well. Should it be logging as root, I assume? Uh, I don't think it matters. Okay, let me try. Huh. Um, can you do a. Hmm. I wonder if the Should path was an issue. So if you do the SCP again, but don't specify like the tilde slash at the end. Yeah, I see. Yes. Okay, and then try the SSH again. Huh. Um, try the, the SSH the... and do a um, dot slash SH as the command specifically at the end. Okay, and then try adding the dash T flag to get a terminal. I feel like this might be something to do with my SSH config. Maybe. I've had these SSH muxes have caused me problems before. I feel like I should probably just stop doing that. Mm. Try specifying on the command line dash capital S none, which should just disable any any sharing. Yeah. Okay. Exact request, request failed, failed. channel zero. Okay. Um, go back to the web interface and see if it's spitting out anything in the in the log. Uh, reload this page. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're seeing it. Okay, cool. So Permission what's, denied. What's it Did we not make it executable? Oh, yeah, it's not executable. Yeah, you'll need to change mod yep. Okay. Yep. Easy enough. Yep. Right. Um, and also and the tar... break glass, I think, right? Not just the symlink. Just to be sure here, right? Because there's something oh, going on. Busy box? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Busy box is what I meant. Yep. And then make a new tar ball. And yeah. Then... Yeah. <laughs> SCP, SCP latency, uh, control R, tar, C, F. Yep. Okay. Uh, the shell. Mm -hmm. And then SCP, that tar ball to the host. Yep. Yes. Yeah, permission denied. How many times, know, how many times have you run into that problem? I've done the exact same thing a million times, you know? So mm -hmm. if I, so if I just SSH mm -hmm. with no arguments, try, try this, yeah. Work? yeah, yeah, yeah. No arguments should work. I think maybe, uh, dash T. And maybe the sharing just needs to be disabled again. Yeah, try to dash couple s none. Huh. Shell request uh, failed. Check the log uh, again. Check the logs. Oh, it might yeah. also be that you might need to restart it after the first. Um... SH not found in path. Mm hmm. Interesting. Should I? You uh, yeah, try, try restarting. Path? Try restarting break glass. Okay. It's very tall. Um, and then do the SCP again, and then do the SSH again. Are these, okay, attempt two, starting break glass. Yeah. Okay, so do the SCP. Mm -hmm. SCP, break glass into the root of the. Yep. Yes. <sighs> okay. Well, I should fix that, but it's just annoying. Yeah, yeah. And then the okay. SSH again with the dash capital S none. Yeah. Dash T, should I specify the shell command? Uh, or? Yeah, do the dot slash SH. There yeah, we go. Nice. Okay. Hey. Whew. Um, well, now people on the stream have already seen how to debug this in case it's not working, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So in here now, if you do like a PS, uh, you get like a process list, right? Uh, yeah. So you can see the user break glass process is running. The go crazy init process yep. is running. NTP is running. Uh, Webstat, etc. So yeah, um, all of our stuff like now accessible via a little uh, busybox shell, just like any nice. other embedded Linux. Yep. Um, so the interesting bit now here is um, you can actually kind of use this to iterate, right? You could um, pack your program into the tarball and then just SCP it over, um, start it via SSH. Um, use it that way for quick development. Um, you can go in like one step further and do like an SSHFS based thing, uh, which I like to do sometimes, but it's not so polished. Um, so we're yeah. not going to get into it on stream, I think. But um, yeah, this is like the next step even, right? Like you don't even need to update the tarball. You can leave your SSH connection running. It would just use an SSHFS connection to your host and that way run the binaries that you prepare. Um, that is what I usually do. So that would be like the full um, the, the the full way. So are you, are you, are you, did you just mention that you do SSH from the go crazy Raspberry Pi to your host? Yeah, it's using reverse SSHFS. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Um, yeah, pretty pretty elaborate setup. Um, 
I have an article I think on my blog about how this works. Uh, if you search for CPU in my argument, uh, in my in my uh, article list, um, you should find it. Mm -hmm. um, somebody was asking on chat. Uh, so break glass runs an SH executable in break glass .tar image on the Pi. So the break glass .tar, you transfer it from your computer into the memory of the Pi, right? It's never written to disk. Um, but yeah, uh, you you provide the starball and then it runs the program that you give it in the starball, right? You copy an environment onto the the RAM of the Raspberry Pi and then run a program in there. That's how it works. Cool. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah. So we can use this. Oh, so one more thing that we now want to um, make sure is working is the network update, right? Yes. Um, so the way we can do this is uh, you can just uh, exit out of there, control D out of there or whatever, um, and then uh, you should be in the directory where your make file is, right? And in the make file, right. which you have open on the left of your screen, you can just go and change the dash override to be dash update equals yes. That's it. Yeah, and then just remove the rest of that device path there. Yep, and then okay. just save that and do make and see if that works. Oh, it might not work because so, of the host name, right? I think this yeah. is the step where, oh yeah, okay, okay. So what you can do now is um, if you scroll up in your terminal, do you still have the output from when we ran the go crazy packer to write the SD card? Yeah, we do. Yes. Uh, cool. If you go in there and you copy and paste the URL that you have in there, uh, like the HTTP go crazy, et cetera, um, so, yeah. and paste it as the argument to the dash update, yeah. And then change the host name to work in your network. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so if you do this, uh, it should work, right? It, this should update your Pi. So just do make so if and I run see make if this now. works. And the way you can verify that this worked is by looking at the build timestamp also, right? So, um, oh, look, your SD card write speeds are really good. You have 26 megabytes per second. Nice. Yeah. Um, I think I only got like 20-ish on my uh, Pi when I was using an SD card still. Um, so maybe you just got a good SD card. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it takes like a little while for the device to come back up because it needs to do a full reboot, right? Because you've just changed everything about it, like a full installation. Um, yep. One thing that we should also add for future iterations is the dash hostname flag, just so that the URL that the Go Crazy Packer will automatically spit out uh, is going to match what you have in your network, and then you can just switch from the dash update equals long URL to a dash update equals yes, um, and then we'll just use the default URL. Um, and also, it will show the host name in the web interface, right? So it's good to set it anyway. Something like this? Yep, exactly. That should work. OK, it's rebooted now, so do I um, again? Yeah, I mean, you could just look at the web interface real quick first to see if that worked. Um, and pay attention to the build timestamp before you reload. So, OK. Oh, yeah, sure. there you go. <laughs> but it did change. Uh, I did pay attention. So um, okay. this is now the updated version, right? And if we if you now run the make again, uh, you should also see the host name in the top right change after the device comes back. Excellent. OK. Uh, host name is the argument? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, just try make. This should work. Yep. Uh, somebody was asking in my chat, so make file with update and install targets would be great. Yeah, um, unfortunately, it's up to you to write it though, right? Um, because there's really, as you can see, there's not much plumbing going on in the make file, right? It, you could also use a shell script or uh, a mage file or a rake file or um, I don't know, um, whatever you have. Um, Looks like I failed to switch. Yeah. Huh. Just try again, maybe. I don't know why it will fail. Um, uh, let me let me finish my thought and then we're going to look into this failure. Um, so yes. the the make file, um, it's just a collection of the things that you want your device to be, right? You can see here there's like credentials, URLs, host names, lists of packages to install. So this is all user configuration, I would say, which is why we don't provide a make file um, from like you know the the project doesn't come with a make file is what I'm trying to say. All right. Um, so it posts and then it gets an EOF. This is interesting. Why would we get an EOF? Yeah. Is it something to do with the host name being different from the default? Oh, yes. Um, I think this has to do with us changing the host name. Um, and well, yeah, yeah, because the, the reason is that uh, the part UUID that we use is derived from the host name. Uh, so you can see that that actually also changed, right? If you look at the part UUID up there, it says FF5CF, et cetera. And this was different mm -hmm. before. 
Right. Um, so one solution to this is to just override an SD card once uh, with the new host name and then use the network update from there on. Uh, we should also change yeah. this so that it doesn't actually fail the update, but just gracefully switches regardless. Um, and I'm going to file a ticket for this uh, right away. But for now, um, the escape hatch is I to do the override. Uh, sure. So, I mean, do you want me, is this, if we don't care about the host name right now, should we just remove the host name flag and move on? Yeah, you can. Right. Because this, we can just keep specifying this URL and it'll work fine. Yep. For sure. Right. Okay. Just do one more update to see so that now, it works now. Yep. So is this implicitly uh, cross compiling for ARM64? It is indeed. Yes. Everything. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, um, you can also override the Go Arch environment variable though, um, which is what we do for router seven because we run it on PC hardware. So we do actually right, set yeah. Go Arch equals AMD sixty four uh, when we built the router right. seven stuff. Yeah, very cool. Okay, it seems to work. Cool. Uh, did it come back up yet? No, it doesn't ping yet. Uh, no, my pings, my pings have halted. So yeah, yeah. but the the update seems to work, so that's great. Yes. Cool. Yeah, this, um, is, this is this is extremely cool. Yeah. It'll take some getting used to. Okay, it looks like it's back up. Okay, so then let's do one more thing um, so that we do the, um, now that we have the network update working, so we no longer need mm -hmm. to, to fiddle with the SD card, um, we also want to have the break glass um, more automated than with the manual SCP and SSH. Um, so now yeah. it's time, I think, to install the uh, wrapper program, um, which if you go back to the break glass tab, uh, at the very top, you can see that uh, it has this, yeah, this one. Um, just mm -hmm. install that, and then let's give it a go. Sure. I had go bin set and it created some issues. Yeah, um, I think with the very latest version of the Packer, there should no longer be any issues. I think I fixed this during the last week. Okay, um, so yeah. Um, Something like that. You don't actually, I don't think you need to .sh actually, so why don't we leave that out? Um, one thing that you should actually specify though is a uh, path to your tarball. Um, so if you do a break glass dash, dash help. Uh, yeah, it has debug a dash tarball. debug tarball pattern. Uh, point this to the uh, break glass .tar that you just created. Uh -huh. And then the host name. Yep. Yeah. Very nice. All right, we're in. Very nice. So this is the experience, can... how it should be, right? Like it starts break glass for you and it immediately gives you a shell. Let me fix my known hosts really quick. Yeah. It's just a, it's a nuisance to keep doing that. Oh yeah. So <laughs> apologies. Uh, let's see here. We got all kinds of stuff from like, you know, SSHing into machines at work and such. So uh, 20 of these. Okay, I believe that will be fixed from now on. One sec, let me make sure. Ah, the uh, SFTP mount is kind of yeah laggy for sure. Mm -hmm. but... Yeah, it is. There we go. Okay, we're good. Nice. Cool. Yeah. I lost yeah. my VS code. Um, I can bring it back. So. So what you can do now is we could set up a, com a compile command that creates a new tarball, right? So, you know, if, yeah. if you wanted to iterate now, right, um, you would just do a go arch equals arm64, cross compile it like that, um, set the sego enable to zero for good measure, um, yep. and then um, just include that binary in your tarball, right? And you'll be able to just run a break class and run your program, see that way if it works, and you can skip the entire update cycle. Yeah, very cool. Um, so should we get started with that or is there like, I think now is a good time to pause and reflect like all of the things we've done, uh, what we've got set up now, any questions, any clarifications? I don't think I have anything immediately. Um, yeah, I guess I'll be curious to see how the application development cycle goes. So this is Linux. There is no libc. So Cgo type things will not work, but anything that uses pure Go interfaces will work fine. So, Absolutely. Um, I even so actually, like, so there, there's actually like a, a slight nuance to that even, right? Which is that Seiko will actually work if you link it statically. Oh, okay. Which yep. you can do, right? It just requires more flags. Um, yep. And you can you cannot necessarily do this all the time. Like one example where it wouldn't work is for um, 
dynamic loading of plugins, right? For example, uh, Libc's name service resolution plugins, or um, as I learned recently, if you're more into network stuff, there is the TC command for traffic control stuff, um, where it also has like a bunch of different load balancing or I don't know, like bucketing algorithms and stuff like that. And those actually also are shared plugins that are loaded at runtime by the TC program. Didn't know that. Excellent. Yeah, but for sure, it is going to be easier if you just use Go code. Um, so we're going to try and avoid CGO for today, I think. Yeah, sounds good to me. I think that the, uh, off the top of my head, assuming we were building some kind of SSH to serial console bridge, I think that that would involve X crypto SSH and then Tarm Go serial, something like that. And I think, I think neither of those use CGO. So yeah, we should be okay. Absolutely. Um, there is actually, uh, do you know of the Glider Labs SSH package? I know, I'm familiar with the name. Isn't it the easier to use one? Yeah. Um, it okay. is, yeah, it is much easier, um, specifically for things such as, you know, what you have in mind, I think. Um, let me, uh, let me take a quick look, see if I can. Perfect. Because I think I have some demo code actually, um, which is, which might come in handy for, for this project. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, why don't we actually... Um... I did have one question, actually. Oh, yeah, so, sure. As far as, like, the firmware files, like, this, this is all handled automatically. Like, I don't have to care about the firmware on my Raspberry Pi. This is just taken care of by Go Crazy. That is almost correct. So um, whatever you have uh, configured in your go.mod system is going to end up on the device. So I see. the okay. one step that you still need to do is... Um, actually pull in new versions of the Go packages that represent the firmware and or the kernel, et cetera, right? So right, you would need okay. to do like a go get command. And personally, I just do that in a cron job um, that I run every day. So I have a cron job that runs on my computer, um, which just goes through all of my instances and it does a go get of the important packages like the firmware, the kernel, the EEPROM, um, and any of the you know programs that I actually want to run on there. And then it just builds a new image and installs that. Um, so that would be where your policy decisions also come into play, right? Like maybe your policy is um, you never update kernel and firmware unless you have to, um, but you do update your program every day. Or your policy might be you update kernel every day. Um, and also, I mean, if you if you update anything every day, you might as well update everything every day, right? But um, yep. I'm just trying to say there's different decisions here that could make sense, right? Like if you're deploying a device and you want to, like place it in, I don't know, let's, let's, let's say, you know, you're, you're, I don't know, helping out a church set up their IT infrastructure, right? And then you place the device there and you leave and you come back next year. Maybe that's your setup, right? And then you don't want different versions and you don't have updates every day and stuff like that. Yeah, um, but for at home, I totally dig the, uh, yeah, let's just have a cron job that tries to update everything to the latest version and just runs this, right? Yeah, makes sense. Very cool. So I guess I'm looking at my Go mod here, and it would appear that the firmware is, you know, it looks like June 27th in there, which is good. Yep. And then the RPI EEPROM is roughly June 18th, which I assume is the last time you updated it. So in theory, I'm already up to date. Yep. Absolutely. And yeah. I didn't the, have to, the default have is to you should be up to date. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have to care at all. I didn't have to do anything special. It's just, it's all up to date, which is exactly. very nice. Awesome. So now we're at the point where we could, in theory, start developing a Go application and just get it on there and see how it works. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Uh, I think I'm going to refill my water and such really quick. I'll be back in just a minute or so. Yeah. Um, okay, that was too late. Never mind. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let me know in the chat. Um, in case you're curious, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna walk you through this. Um, even though Matt's away, we can recap this later. Um, and my apologies to the, um, viewers of the stream who can't see it right now. Um, we'll switch back to it later. So this is like the, um, wake on LAN gateway that I have. That is the demo code that I was talking about earlier where we use the Glider Labs SSH package. Um, and what this does is uh, it is sort of a gateway where 
you would log into the gateway and then the gateway uses wake online to wake up the destination computer. And then once the destination computer actually came online, the gateway just forwards your connection. So from the perspective of the user, it looks like it is just a little bit slow to log in that computer for the first time, but under the covers, it actually is started up, right? So this is nice if you have a machine that you want to use sometimes, but not all the time. Um, and it supports Wake on LAN, and then you can just have another machine, like a little Raspberry Pi, wake it up and proxy the connections. Um, and we're using the Glider Labs SSH for that, and it's actually very simple. Like this is the whole program. It's 164 lines. Um, it does do privilege separation <laughs> um, in these lines, right? Um, it does do listener configuration. But then the, the really interesting bit is um, you specify where you have the authorized keys from, you parse these authorized keys. That's a little bit laborious. Uh, maybe there's something that is easier for that. And then you just create this ssh.server struct and it has a bunch of callbacks and handlers. And then um, you can like, you know, you can right, just very, very quickly have an SSH server. Um, yeah, so I was just walking people through the Wake Online gateway and I'm gonna recap this for you. Can you switch your stream to the scene where people can see what I have on screen? Yep, all done. Cool. Um, so I was just telling people um, that this is the Wake Online gateway. So the idea is uh, you connect via SSH to a machine and the machine, if it is offline, like turned off, will automatically be woken up using Wake Online before then the gateway forwards the connection to the machine. Um, so this is uh, this should give you an impression of how the Glider Labs SSH package is to use because essentially um, I'm just specifying a couple of callbacks here and a couple of options. Um, with regards to the key material, right? Um, so like authorized yeah. key checking, host key file, and then there's just this listen and serve. And whenever there's an incoming TCP IP connection, um, I'm just sending the magic packet here and then I'm uh, sending a ping. And once the ping comes back, I just call the uh, Glider Labs direct TCP IP handler to just then forward, like do the rest of the connection handling, right? Uh, so this That's is so cool. this is very simple. So simple too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would strongly recommend that we take a look at this uh, for our needs uh, in the development of the yeah. program, um, and maybe yeah, maybe maybe this is good enough to to get us good part of the way. Certainly. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Okay. So Chadwise, um, neat idea to broadcast a pair programming session. Nice. Uh, glad you like it. Will you build something with Go Crazy or just wandering around? We will build something with it. Um, I'm going to switch my stream back to Matt Layer's stream. Um, and then Matt can give a quick recap of what we are about to build. Mm -hmm. Right, so my goal for today is I have a Raspberry Pi that I primarily use as kind of a console server. So I have cheap consumer hardware that does not have things like consoles built in or IPMI or et cetera. So I have my server over there running in the corner and although it doesn't happen much these days, uh, I occasionally do break the networking and such, and I end up in a situation where it is convenient to have an out-of-band access to that. So I actually have a, a PCIe serial card installed in the server. I've got Linux set up to use that as a console, and then I use a Raspberry Pi with a USB to serial adapter to run Minicom previously on the Raspberry Pi, uh, get in there, make changes, fix things, whatever I need to do, reboot the machine, etc., and bring it back up. So it's just a very convenient way for me to make sure that I can... Uh, get into my machines even if uh, the networking is broken or SSH is down or similar. So the goal is instead of running a full Linux here like a Debian or an Ubuntu or etc., I run a go crazy appliance that has just the minimal program we need to essentially take an SSH connection and forward it to a serial port is the goal for today. So if we can get something along those lines working or perhaps even just the SSH portion, I think I would be pretty happy, you know, because then at that point I can play around with the intricacies of the serial. So nice, nice. So I can see two big things here that we need to do. One of them is actually, you know, physically plug in uh, the USB to serial into the Raspberry Pi and then actually configure it programmatically. Right. And then the, the second big thing is the SSH interface to the then already configured serial port. Right. Um, I have actually right. already written code that does the serial port initialization. So you can just copy and paste that if you want. Um, it's that would be the... very helpful because that's the part I know nothing about. So. <laughs> nice. Uh, so let's walk through it together. So uh, go to github.com slash go crazy slash bakery. Okay, yeah. Uh, question question from my chat. Is there, a watchdog in, is there a watchdog in case I assume the device is panicked? Yes, there is. And it is enabled by default. Um, awesome. We had actually on the last stream, uh, when I was working on the Pi EEPROM stuff, we actually ran into a case where the watchdog wasn't working correctly. And that was actually, um, 
because the watchdog was set up in like funk main so to say and we were already panicking in funk in it so we were just panicking too early so now i've moved that code around so that the watchdog is actually set up as the very first thing that, that the device does which is as it should be right um, and i've actually also tested this so this works much better now um nice uh thanks for the for the chat stuff um yeah there is a blog post um refer to that url i think there's also uh, exclamation point setup i believe yeah and then uh, that blog post is linked um, a blog post, the question was about my setup that I'm using. Um, cool. So uh, back to the stream. So the bakery stuff is where um, I'm doing like, uh, if you go to CMD slash. Uh, yeah, sorry. I have one more question from my chat. Oh, you meant watchdog for my server, right? Serial, only, serial console only helps you if it's not panicked. Yeah, I, I need to set that up still. I'm not sure if my device supports. I'm not sure if it has like a watchdog device. It's just consumer gear, but. Uh, yeah. In general, I'm not too worried about like kernel panics. I'm more worried about like I broke the networking. If so, you're worried about you know, kernel panics, though, you can also just specify the panic equals argument when booting your computer. So you could set panic equals five, and then five seconds after kernel panic, your device just reboots. Oh, perfect. Okay. So that's sort of the the middle way between a full blown hardware watchdog um, and having nothing. Right. Cool. Uh, um, cool. So I apologize. What, what command are we looking at? Yeah. Um, check out the bootery. Um, serial. There's a serial .go. So this awesome. is like this is like the minimum serial setup, right? Uh, yeah. It is just like a couple of syscalls. It's all Linux specific, but we don't need it to work anywhere else. Uh, it mm -hmm. sets a baud rate of 115k2, which is what you should be using anyway. Um, it has all of the regular stuff like eight and two stop bits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so this is like you know if if you were to run a screen on your serial port or minicom or anything and you just said yeah use 115k2 um, that is what it would do so you can just call that function and you should have your serial port ready to go okay cool um i'm curious how much this overlaps i thought you were i wasn't sure if you were referring to like the uh just the serial like opening the serial port or what but is the idea here is that you os open the serial port you absolutely use um, if you go con, back Syscall actually con. Go back to the other file, you should see it used in there, and that should give you the complete picture. If you search for like configure, I think it's configure serial or something. Yeah. Yep, there you exactly. Go. Okay. So there's the OS on open file right above um, where you have the, the B serial port is going to be something like def TTY USB1 or something, or you know, right. def serial by ID, et cetera. Though these names don't exist on Go Crazy because we don't have UDEF running. So the, the nice links that we've used earlier on stream, we can't use them. I see. Okay. Yeah, this this is this will do just fine. Yeah, for sure. So I um, can just Yeah, steal you, this you're gonna need to yeah, yeah, just steal this whole thing. Um and that should work. Mm -hmm. Ah, shoot. Wrong shortcut. Wrong shortcut again. There we go. Uh anyway. So now we have our hello module in here. Should we be create a new I mean we got our hello program, I guess the yeah, I mean, you can just create a new package in there. You could reuse the hello program if you wanted to, uh, either way. Uh, sure, I mean, I suppose we could just rename the module and such. So what's the, how do we start here? So the, the goal is to- Well, so I would we say, uh, this... yeah, put this whole stuff that you're stealing here uh, into a separate function and then just call that function. Yes. Right. So Funk open serial uh, yeah. device string. And then so it's going to return a IO read, write, closer or something like that. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, and then you need to steal your configuration as well. Yeah, so. exactly. And that can actually just go into a separate file. Uh, oh, you mean as far as like, I mean, just for now we can just do this. Oh yeah, easy, sure, you can also do that, yeah. Sure. Excellent, and I see you've got things like the baud and everything hard coded yeah, yeah. here, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think that's fine. I, yeah. Actually, I'm pretty sure it's been a while since I touched it, but I'm pretty sure my serial devices are all uh, 11.5, yeah. 200. Yeah. But... Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So we need to fix a couple of function yep. signatures here. Yep. There. Uh, and then in the end, you want to port. return your comma nil. Yes. Return your nil. Actually, yeah. you are in this case, but that's fine. Um, okay, well, it compiles now. That's good. So, 
Uh huh. So the way the way this is gonna work is we need to figure out. So I need to get my Raspberry Pi back over there and plug in the USB device, don't I? So yeah, one thing. So I think the the best test setup is gonna be. Um, I mean, ideally, you would have something that just generates data onto the serial port, right? So you could just have like, um, if your server is configured with the serial port as its primary TTY, you could just use echo hello to def console. Um, if it's not configured like that, it might still work if you did um, echo hello to def TTY S0 or something like that. And yeah. then the next step, I think, would be, um, yeah, to connect the Raspberry Pi's uh, USB to serial to that port and just call open serial and just do a read in a loop. And whenever you read a full line, you print a line. And then we're just going to verify that we can send something from your server to the Pi. Right, OK. So I think probably at this point, I should move the Raspberry Pi back over. Now we've got the network booting. I thought yeah. we were going to be doing more SD card work, which is why I moved it yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Sorry about that. Um, no, it's no, only it's for okay. setting it's, up. <laughs> oh, it's good to know. Um, yeah, so I will go ahead and move that back really quick. And then I'll uh, cool. I'll move it, and then we'll get it rebooted, and we'll see what happens. So yeah. sounds good. The ping going again, so we're gonna take it down really quick, and I can just turn this off. There's nothing, yeah, yeah, there's nothing sure. running on here that's important. So okay, it's off, and I'm gonna move it. Nice. As always, just let me know if you have any questions in the meantime. You know, hopefully we won't have too many interruptions like this where we need to reconfigure the hardware. You said UDEV is not working, if I'm correct, yes. How can you populate DEV? Is it static? Turns out there's actually sort of like a middle step in between like not having anything set up for you and having everything set up by UDEF. And that step is called DEF TMPFS, which is sort of a kernel provided pseudo file system that gives you the most important device nodes. It will not give you like all of the convenience links um, such as DEF disk by ID, etc. But it will give you, for example, DEF SDA1. Uh, so we're just mounting DEF TMPFS and we're just making do with the devices that are available in there. Um, if we went back to the serial um, bakery example, uh, in there we actually have code to identify the different USB devices without having to use UDEF. We can just look at the kernel provided info directly. Uh, you can get stuff such as the vendor and, and, and product ID from there. Okay, it is all plugged in. I have the USB to serial adapter plugged in and the serial console has already, uh, as far as I can remember, it's configured on the server. Um, cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So there we go. Raspberry Pi is back up. Nice. Uh, another oh, thing you could do now is, uh, yeah, do the break loss again. And just do yep. an ls-l uh, slash dev slash to see if you have the device node for your USB to serial. Because it might be that uh, you're using one of them that is not actually, uh, for which we don't have the kernel driver enabled. So we'll need to verify uh, this. Dev slash, apologies. Yeah, TTY star, saying? I guess. Um, I don't know like what that USB, yeah, TTY, TTY USB, USB zero. zero. That does look good. Um, you could also check in D message to see what sort of device it is. Perhaps, um, yeah. FTDI USB serial now attached to TTY USB zero. Is that what you expect? Like, it, is it an FTDI chip? Ah, uh, yeah. This this seems familiar. My yeah. my previous setup was just yeah, Dev TTY USB mini com with Dev TTY USB. Cool, so cool. This Perfect. seems like it's working. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, cool. Okay. So driver uh, driver wise, we should be good. So now it is really time to just run that program, right? Yep. So serial error. Uh, open serial. Uh, we're gonna hard code for now. Dev TTY yep. USB zero. Uh, failed to open serial port. Defer serial close. Yep. And then we want to read from the serial console in a loop, right? Exactly. So, uh, nope. I want an infinite loop. Uh, four. 
can actually just use a buffio um, dot new scanner, right? It will, it okay, will do yeah, the, good, the good line call. stuff uh, for you. Scanner. Serial for s scan. Yep. Okay, okay, okay. And mm -hmm. then uh, format that print line s dot text. Yeah, though yep. I would actually recommend to use log dot print line here, uh, just so that we okay. get timestamps as well. Yes, it would be helpful Good call. for okay. debugging. Um, and maybe just. Um, like add a little well the log message should be good enough yeah never mind um i was about to okay. say well you know maybe um use a percent q so that we have so we can uh limit you know where the serial output starts and ends maybe that's going to be interesting for debugging i think i think that's the right call yeah all right cool so uh yeah, uh, yeah so we're we're at the point now where we have this program and then in theory should do something um so what i want to do now i think we should probably give this some kind of meaningful name that isn't hello. So we just change <laughs> yeah. like the go mod and such. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So let's call this uh, serial or console server. I don't know. What do you, what is this? What's a good, what's a good go crazy name? C console server sounds about right to me. Uh, maybe abbreviated like console SRV or something, you know, whatever you could imagine looking good under uh, github.com slash MD layer, right? <laughs> Yeah, totally. Uh, Concert, that's fine. Um, cool. It conserves your sanity because you can get into your servers. <laughs> Very that's nice. Okay. Very nice. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, go mod is fixed. Everything is fixed. Cool. Hello.go is now main.go. Um, so I'm actually really surprised how all the SFTP stuff is, or the SSH yeah. FS stuff is keeping up. Yeah, nice. Uh, indeed, yeah. It doesn't seem to be a problem in VS Code at all. Yeah. Uh, cool. So we're at the point now where we have, in theory, a Go application that can be used to do something. Yeah. So, so for development, I would recommend you now actually build this right locally so, without using the Go Crazy Packer. So cross compile it for ARM64. Yeah, exactly. So just go into directory, go arch ARM64, cgo enable equals zero. Yep. Just to be sure. Yep. Uh, go build. Yeah, that's it and then check what sort of binary you got from that. Oh yeah, it writes to the SSHFS, so that's gonna be a little bit yes. slow as well. Uh, yeah, you could okay. totally do a go build dash O and you know, write it into temp to avoid that run trip, but you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Cool, that looks good. And now include that in the tarball and then do a break class again. Oh, right. So I guess we'll, okay, so tar CF, nope, ah. Probably lost the, I'm probably in the wrong shell. Yeah, I was in the shell up here. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in the meantime, question from chat. If we want to record the log, should we write to slash perm? If we write to a file, can we be able to view it in the web UI? Uh, in the Go Crazy web UI, you will by default only see what is written to standard out and standard error, which is not persisted to slash perm. However, um, you're free in your program to write to slash perm in addition to printing to standard error and standard out or instead of printing to standard out and standard error. Uh, in fact, for the for the console server, I would probably say it should write to slash perm indeed. Um, and if you wanted to view the logs, you would probably not view it in the web UI. It could have its own UI. It could be able to maybe play back logs via SSH if it would log in or it could have an HTTP UI, you know, whatever. Uh, we can figure it out, but um, I don't think it needs to happen via the Go Crazy UI. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, cool. So in your tar command here, now add the binary name, right? The uh, yep. what's called con SRV. So we have sh and we have con SRV. Yeah, just like that. Yep. Um, and then start the break loss command from just two commands ago again. Yep. This is uh this is extremely cool. It is not as difficult as I thought it would be, which yeah. is, I mean, just, I guess goes to show like, you know, your, your level of like, you know, how much time and thought you've put into the making this system really nice. Um, it, the thing is, is like, I just assumed that like, you know, with Raspberry Pi and like all this like cross compilation, pure go user land, it would be more difficult, but it seems yeah. like you've got very good tooling that makes it, uh, once you understand the concepts makes things much easier. So this is, this is great so far. For sure. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. Cool. So you okay. can see it took a little bit longer to upload the tarball now. It also tells you how big the files are in the tarball. 
Um, mm -hmm. And it, like you can you can see uh, <laughs> you can see the mistakes I've made because it tells you when you've last modified the file that you just uploaded, right? So you can see there it says thirty seconds ago. If it said anything else, we would be like, oh yeah, we fat fingered that path. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. So now you can just do dot slash conserve and see if that works, right? So it appears to have opened something. So now I guess if I log into my server, I could mm -hmm. potentially make some output here that would be interesting. Cool, so yeah, let's do it. All right, uh, let's see here. So echo, hello, go crazy to dev console, you think? Yeah, maybe, try that first. Permission denied, so this would be sudo t. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm anxious. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. oh wow! That's so cool. Very nice. Unbelievable. So if I, so I don't actually care. Like I could just reboot my server right now and make a bunch of D message stuff pop up if we wanted to or something. But yeah, I don't, but maybe. I mean, it's working. I right? wonder. I wonder if I could like load a. Is there like a kernel module I could load just to make it something easy? Or I could like. Oh, you could do logger. Um, logger prints to the. Is it syslog and or kernel log? I don't know. I think there is a way to inject messages into D message. Logger. I'm not actually, I don't think I've ever actually used, used that. Yeah. Uh, just Either try way, it's just it's type a, S anything into it, right? Just do uh, echo hello pipe logger, see where that ends up. It might only be the syslog though. Yeah, see. I didn't go to console, but mm. uh, echo 2k message, Taryn says, okay. Ah, right. Pipe in 2k message? Is k message a command? I'm only familiar uh, with 2k message. I, I think it's def k message. Okay. So probably sudo t again. Yeah. Uh, nope, doesn't seem so. But well, maybe we can it tell did that go into the k message, but not onto the serial port because there's. I think there's also message priorities and stuff. Could be, yeah. Yeah. That's unbelievably cool, though, that we uh, got this working. So now the goal would be to set up like a bi-directional communication. But yeah, yeah, for sure. Because in theory, right now I've got a uh, I've got like a Getty sitting there, mm, like right. waiting for you to. So you, you could to do you something. could you could totally just um, like actually I think you could just hook up that reader writer with standard in standard out, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like think if, I, I think if you just did well. two I/O dot copies in two separate goroutines, that yep. should maybe be all that we need to actually use that zero console. Copy, uh, well, so we're gonna copy from the serial port to OS standard out. Yep. And of course we're gonna need things like error handling and such, but we're gonna yeah, yeah, omit yeah. that for now. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna copy to the serial console from OS standard in. Yeah. And then remove all of that stuff, yeah. Yeah, so now we need, we need we'll do an empty select for now. Yep. That'll, yep. that'll work fine. Yep, sounds yep. good. Cool. Uh, by the way, so for, for those who aren't familiar with this trick, so, you could do an infinite loop here, but that's going to spin your your CPU and waste cycles. So if you just want something to block forever, an empty select will do it in the smart way because it'll park the Go routines. So this is a nice little way to tell the Go runtime, like, hey, just wait forever. Cool. So let's rebuild uh, this. Will you, oh, sorry. Will you, you pipe it to, to will you pipe it to an SSH and IO pipe? IO copy, I guess I meant. I guess I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're saying. Apologies. But I think this will I think this will give us a demonstration of what we're going for here. Yes, yeah, so let's give this a go here. So... Uh, apologies, Michael, you were saying? Um, oh, yeah, I was just saying rebuild this. Um, this time you can use the go build and redirect it, stash o, um, and then try yes. to tar CF. And let's see if that makes everything a little bit more convenient for you. Yeah, let's do this all. Let's see if we can do this all with like a one liner. So yeah, go exactly. arch arm64, uh, cgo enabled equals zero. Yeah. Go build dash o temp conserve. Yep. And tar temp conserve. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And okay. you can also move the break last tar out of the SFTP mount. Just move it into temp as well. Yeah, that'd probably be easier, huh? Yeah. Uh, temp break glass tar yeah. dereference. Yeah. yeah, try this. Yes. Cool. Doesn't seem to have made too much of a difference. Maybe just reading the I/O reading. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah. let's go back in. Uh, this time. Oh, shoot, it's a wrong temp. Yeah. Wrong tarball. Yeah. To get my shell back. Oh. There we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Temp break glass. Yeah. Oh, goodness. It's doing that thing. <laughs> oh, the latency. 
Yeah, uh, temp break glass dot tar. Yeah, try this. Okay, cool. There we go. This was a lot faster. Nice, nice and quick. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, so temp. Oh, it it copied in the. Uh -huh, yeah, it, it copied did. in with the relative path. Yeah, but yeah, no worries. So that's something that, that works. works. Cool. Try okay. enter. Um, Press enter here now. Oh. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is gonna, yeah, Hunter too. Yeah. So okay, but it, so it's definitely working, but yeah. it's not doing things like masking the password input. So no. I wonder if I can. Uh, I mean, is give, that me, even, give me just a sec. Is that even a thing on the serial port though? Uh, I have no idea, actually. Um, yeah. We might be able to turn off. Echo you, you might, you might want to, you might want to add a new user here with a separate password just for the stream, so that if yes. you make a mistake here, you won't leak your password. Okay, so I'm I'm in I'm in there. Yeah, you're probably right. But so I guess like we're on we're on NixOS now over serial console. So if I do cow say hello with comma, comma is a cool little NixOS tool that will say just figure out how to install this thing. Oh. I didn't know this. There we go. So we are running over serial console piped into SSH. Extremely cool. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should make another user for this, actually. It's probably yeah. a good idea. Uh, make so, a user and uh, then also close the terminal that you have there because it is tainted now. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yep, I will. Uh, all right, give me give me a sec. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Better be safe. This is this is hilarious. Uh-oh. Yeah, but you can see, like, you know, all of the platform stuff is now out of the way, right? Like, we we have the serial working. Now it's just a matter of writing a couple lines ago. Yep. Uh, so Terran says really quick, yeah, that's a terminal feature and your term isn't set up. Yeah, so we could do the terminal commands that would take the uh, the terminal yeah. or the SSH and disable echo temporarily or something. Um, but I, I guess I don't know. I mean, for, for my purposes, this is probably okay, but we could, we can make it smarter. We'll, we'll yeah. have time. So anyway. Um, yeah, I think yeah. that's a feature for later. So, like all of that stuff is very intricate. Uh, like all of the, the exactly. SK cords and terminal stuff and plumbing and SSH. Ugh. Um, so I, I think I we should focus on user... the basics. If I want to add a user to my system, I could probably do that really quick with NixOS magic. Um, let's see here. So nano. All right. Yeah. NixOS. Uh, this is all open source. So where are my user configs? Actually, yeah, users, users. Where do I enable my? I'm glad to remember how to do this. I let me let me check out. Let me check really quick. So the thing is, so I'm, since I'm using NixOS, I have the, um, I've got the user ad commands and stuff like totally disabled. Like I actually only manage my users in a declarative way. So yeah, uh, certainly a good way, but uh, you need to remember how it works. <laughs> That's always the downside. Right. So uh, users dot users dot uh, stream equals normal user equals true. Uh, UID doesn't matter. Extra groups don't care. Hash password. So, is there an easy way to generate a password hash without? Hmm. I mean, probably, but I haven't done it in years. Yeah, I haven't done it in years either. Um, this might work okay. We could potentially just do. I think this might work. So, if I do this, then we can apply this configuration. So, switch. No upgrades, please. Uh, yeah, so once I modify my NixOS config, I do this rebuild switch. This will actually rebuild the configuration based upon my new config files. And in theory, I should have a new user coming up and we can set the password to something silly. Cool. Like Hunter2. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, password for stream. New password. Uh, Hunter2. Hunter2. Yes. Nice. Okay. Temp conserve. Oh, it's still logged in. Sure. Um, yep. Just control D. Yeah, one sec. Let me make sure the password isn't anywhere. Yeah. So welcome to NixOS. Okay. Cool. Um, so now we are stream. Hunter 2. Very nice. Hey, we are logged in. Nice. Cow say hello. Oh, comma's not in my path anymore, but oh. it's okay. Yeah, this is very cool. So now we have a working serial console to thing 
built over Raspberry Pi, go crazy. This is awesome. This is exactly what I hope for. I mean, we got to put an SSH front end on it, but yeah, this was significantly easier than I would have expected even. So yeah. very cool. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, so what's the what do you think is the next plan? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, hey, we could start with the SSH stuff now, right? Sure, sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, probably, so I feel like this okay, is so for, the, for the SSH stuff, uh, there is the interesting side effect that we can just, like, develop this on your machine, right? Like, there's no need to copy this over to the Pi for the very first iteration. So we can just try to get, right. like, a Glider Labs SSH server working with uh, authorized keys and um, host keys and then just, like, you know, accept a session and have any command do anything, right? And then wire it up. Yeah, totally. So that would mean that we probably want to, so for a while we'll go over here to a full screen. We will mm -hmm. uh, block before we get to any of the serial code because we're not going to do that. So the goal here is going to be to set up Lighter Labs SSH. And this is all going to work on any Linux. So you have your... Where, where do you have your Glider Labs SSH example? Can you send me that? It wasn't oh, yeah. Tools. Um, yes. Um, how do I send this to you in a good way? Just a Twitter message? Uh, you can drop it in the Twitch chat. It's fine. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, apologies. I had my chat closed for a little bit. So let's see here. Dropped it into so... my chat. Excellent. Uh, recap. So, can you, Michael? Can you recap Glider Labs versus X Crypto? Uh, yeah. So uh, the way I see it, X Crypto is sort of like a low-level primitive in comparison to Glider Labs SSH, right? It's really high-level stuff, and it helps you uh, write an SSH server much, much, much quicker than if you had to do it all by yourself with the X Crypto stuff. Excellent. So, uh, should I copy your entire? I don't think I really want to copy your entire file, right? I mean, no, not necessarily. I don't think the I don't think the callback that I'm using is going to be relevant for us. Uh, so maybe uh, I don't know if there's like a Glider Labs SSH. If you want to pull up like the docs for that package, if there's going to be like an example in there that we can start from more reasonably and then just compare with what I have done on the side as we move along. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay. So yeah, something like this. Yeah. This is exactly what we want. Absolutely. So. Um, I th yeah, uh, really I think quick, the, the, asks, I think the next step is going to be after you after you get this to work to actually make it explicitly locate an, a host key and an authorized keys file, and that you right. can copy from my stuff, and then we should be on a good path. Right. Uh, Taryn, so the, the, the comma tool I'm using in NixOS is by Shopify. So if you go to github.com slash Shopify slash comma, I believe, like comma isn't literally C-O-M-M-A, uh, you will find it. Or if you look up like comma NixOS, I'm sure you'll probably find it as well. Okay, uh, Glider Labs SSH, hello world, IO, mm -hmm. right string, etc. cetera. Um, cool, two, cool. Two, 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 two. seems good. So this is the hello world application. So if we run this locally, we will get, uh, let's see here. Let's just go ahead and start up a new split. Okay, um, go build. So if we build this and we can run it, so like if, actually if I just do go run, yeah. they'll put it in TempFS anyway, right? Yeah, so yeah, go yeah, run yeah. main.go. Cool, sounds good. I think it might not give you a message though that it's ready, so. <laughs> right, so we want to SSH into your local host, 2222. Yep. Local host, 2222. I think you need to use dash P for port. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I always forget SSHs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> See? Glad it lives SSH. Go. Super simple. Yeah, there's a Go SSH server. Easy enough. Yeah. Um, oh, I think it currently doesn't use authentication, does it? So that's why you no. can just log in, right? Um, so if we right. wanted to, like, yeah, I mean, we could do it right or we could do it quick, right? Uh, the quickest way to hook anything up probably would be to, like, you know, just actually, like, is, is the SSH.session, does it implement reader and writer? I, so, I think it probably you, does. I'm you pretty just, sure it does. You, could, you just like put the io.copy calls that we have below and hook that up like that, right? And then you have anonymous, um, unprotected SSH serial console. Which, of course, is not great, but for the purposes of our application right now, I think it's fine. Yep. Um, you know, like we're we're literally just prototyping this. I've got a firewall and everything set up. I'm not too concerned, you know? Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, SSH handles. So now, with instead of OS, instead of these, we were going yeah. to do this within the context of the session. So, 
maybe also leave the message in there. Um, so you can just have like a hello starting serial session now message for clarity. Right. Starting serial connection, something like that. Cool. All right. And then we probably just want to select again. Yeah. Though, do we? Um, yes. Yeah, because we, we yeah, want I think the, you're right. We want I think, the I think session we want to, to persist. This, yeah. yeah. I would assume so. I would assume that unless the session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think the returning from that function terminates the session. OK. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think we're at the point where we can put this in the Raspberry Pi already. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Man, this is going swimmingly. This is a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Uh, OK, <laughs> so uh, I guess I just want to control D here. This will get us back to the Raspberry Pi, I think. Yeah, probably. Here we go. Yeah, OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. So now we want to do go crazy packer, or not go crazy packer, uh, the, the break glass stuff. again, the break um, glass. Yeah, I think you yep. still have the build. If you just actually um, end end that with the break glass, you could just do a one-liner. Yeah, totally. Um, OK. And how do we get conserve in the root directory? I know this is just some tar ink uh, I'm not thinking don't, of. Don't worry about but... it. Don't worry okay. about it. Yep, that, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. it's going to be more complicated right now on stream than it's worth anything. Yes, so I'm going to log out of my... I don't need my server down here anymore. Uh, okay, so we have... We're going to cross-compile, see go disabled, go build, put this in a tarball, use the break glass field, upload it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, start it up so now, and see if we can SSH into this. Right. Uh, so, uh, conserve. Okay, so if I SSH into my Raspberry Pi on port 2222, this should, in theory, be proxying my console. It does. What? Nice. Ah, it's so cool, though. <laughs> It works perfectly, yeah. actually. Yeah, great. And I can just yeah. So this is this is literally exactly what I wanted. Like, there's no there's no protection in place here, but this is exactly the tool I wanted to build, and we built it in not very long with yeah. not very much effort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. Super cool. All right, we're done. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, right. Stream over. Um, yeah, I have still a half an hour for today. Um, so let's see what we want to do next. Um, I mean, there's lots of polish to be done here, right? I mean, I think uh, first step could be the authorized key stuff and the host keys. Sure. Yeah, sounds good to me. I think authorized. I think doing that is probably a good idea. Yeah. So that is something I could steal from your uh, your NAS yeah. tools example. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And if you just yeah, so this bit that you have in front of you, it's reading in the authorized keys and then parsing them. So you'll need that. And you'll need at the bottom of this function, if you scroll down like a page or two, uh, there's ah. like a set of options, I think, that uses what we've read in to actually, yeah, line 94 to 97. Yep, right. All right let's put those in our program. Um, let's see here. So um, I guess we could open the serial console first. We could do this. Yeah, this do... this should probably at this point be a separate function, right? Like, uh, so yeah, definitely. Yeah, no longer work in main, I think. Yeah, and then the the parsing of the authorized keys should probably also be a helper function. Mm -hmm. uh, file string. Should this generate a callback function, probably like this SSH public key auth function? Yeah, um, like I mean, you could either idea. just return that um, map, I think. Yeah, I'll it's return a the map, map of string now. to bool, um, or a callback. Either way, the map's probably better for now. Yeah, the map is fine for now because I don't have. I think Go Please is not happy with everything that's going on here. <laughs> oh, um, you'll I, probably I need to just restart it. Yeah. Oh, well, like if I just restart a sec. Like just restarting the language server should be quick, right? Um, I think it's even like okay, yeah. mouse on something or something. Yep. Uh, language server restart. Oh, okay. Or like that. Yeah, cool. Is it happier now? Seems not. Huh. I think the SSHFS mount might be. Oh, right. Yeah. Is it still doing things? Getting code actions from Go, it said. OK, 
Can you try now? Yeah. Is it better? No. No, okay. Yeah, maybe it's the latency or something else. Oh, there we go. Uh, there was oh, something. yeah. So it so... just took forever. So it was the latency after all. So I guess we could just look at the go docs for this. Anyway, let's just return the map for now. Let's yeah. just keep it easy. Yeah. Um, I just I just don't want to uh, string bool and then error. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so parse authorized keys is this function right here. Yep. Uh, right. Authorized key bytes. Read in the file. File. Authorized key bytes. Authorized is a bool or map. Uh, return authorized. No. Right. Somebody's um, asking on chat, is dash dash d reference to create a copy instead of a link? Yes. Um, this is so that in the tarball, uh, we will have the sh binary, which on our file system is a link, but it will show up as a regular file in the tarball. Right on. This is so cool. Uh, so I guess actually, once we get a little bit of this going, we should probably figure out how to properly integrate this into Go Crazy, because right now I have no idea how other than just the break glass. Yeah, for right. sure. Um, yeah, you mentioned you don't have. You mentioned you're busy in a little bit, so that's fine. Um, we yeah, can... no worries. Um, we can still definitely um, move this in. Um, the only thing we'll need to do for the packer command is uh, specify the go import path, right? Uh, so in here, this could just be main. I think um, should be very simple. Yes, we'll figure this out. Okay. Um, L2 parse authorized keys. So perm conserve. This is going to be some kind of file I set up. Yeah. with my authorized keys and my host key. Yeah, so. yeah. You could make it uh, conserve dot authorized keys for consistency with break glass if you wanted, but no need. Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, I, I was copying the example from your uh, NAS tools, so use oh, different right. convention then. Oh, yeah, maybe I do, actually. Huh? I should probably straighten that out. Yeah, well, I okay. way it works. So I guess for now, we'll do, we'll do a directory just because cool. it seems, uh, seems okay. good. So. Yeah. Uh, host key, authorized keys. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, it seems like this should in yeah, theory, let's give it a and such. Uh, right. Yeah. So let's. Uh, where are we at over here? We've got. This is the local stuff. We don't need this anymore. Okay. Um, I want to break my SSH connection. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I want to exit conserve. I want yep. to get back out here. Yep. And we want to try and build this thing. So mm -hmm. the one letter yep. once again. Yep. So. Exactly. Uh, but right now, there's going to be no. Yeah. So I guess first of all, undefined. Okay. Uh, Twenty nine. Serve. I'll just create a server instance instead of the the global, which is a good idea. Anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. SSH dot server. Okay. Yeah, I don't know which bits you'll need. Uh, I suppose yeah. the address, maybe, or maybe it'll figure this out even on its own. So maybe just try creating one and see what happens. SSH dot server. Uh, serve. Listen and serve. Actually, I think list and serve, this doesn't take an argument anymore. This uses the address. Yeah. Yep. OK. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's why we need it. Uh, yeah. Two, 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 two. Yes. Right. Uh, exactly. Question from the chat. Is the packer somehow copying files to slash perm asking for the auth keys, or should we copy them manually? No, the packer is not doing anything for slash perm. That partition is entirely under your control and under control of the applications that you have installed. So yes, you'll need to copy it manually. Right, I, that was going to be my question as well, but we're going to have to put the files in there manually, which makes sense. Yes. I yeah. think that you know you can't rely on it to do everything for you. You okay. can, however, very easily do this interactively via break glass, right? Because you have a shell and you have the slash perm mounted, so you can just cat files into there or wget Perfect. files okay. from another computer or something like that, right? There's no need to do oh, the whole that. SD card replugging dance right now. Do we have SSH key gen or anything? No. No. So I guess, so I, could I just copy the break glass keys because it's the same ones? For I mean, sure. it's kind of cheating, yeah, yeah, you can. But yeah, yeah. Uh, conserve. So copy break glass to authorized keys to conserve authorized keys. Yep. And copy break glass dot host key. Mm -hmm. Is this so? To clarify, this is probably not a best practice at the moment because we probably want different identities between break glass and the conserve and such. It's debatable, right? I mean, on a regular machine, okay. uh, you would have a one SSH host key per machine. So, right. meh. You could, but I um, don't see a big appeal. Right. So this seems to have started up. Cool. So. That looks good. <laughs> yeah, it does look good. Fun. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, for some reason, my, my mouse selection has been really wonky. I think huh. something upgraded, and I have no idea why, but it's been really, really iffy. Anyway. Okay. Yes. Cool. Uh, we are logged in. I think maybe the... Oh, it's because it's using my... I Since I use my monitor thing, it's using the SSH key already. So if I do this without the SSH config, it would not work, I assume. So if I control D... Oh, <laughs> funny. Okay. <laughs> um, so how do you do SSH like, without a configuration? I don't remember the exact... Is it S-none? Is that right? No. S-none is without any sharing um, of connections. A sharing. Um, um, is it file, file dev null, something like that, right? Yeah, something like that. Yes. Still lets you in. Um, is, is it because the agent is enabled by default? Like, do you have... Uh, uh, is your SSH key the, registered with the agent? I don't have the agent. I think it's the... Does it need a uh, password, your key file? My password, my key file does not need a password now. Well, but then machine, it's... what are you expecting to see here, right? Because SSH will default to your key file, right? Right. Um... Oh, if you wanted to use a different key file, you could use dash I. Dash lowercase i. Right. For the identity file. Yeah, so yeah, let's try, try that. This. Still mm. lets you in. I think we got something slightly wrong here, perhaps. Oh, SSH, this is different. So SSH handle. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Serve right. handle, right? Yeah, yeah, global global here, right? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Paul, who actually puts a password on their key file. Uh, I do I do on some machines. On this particular machine, it is not because I have this machine locked down in such a way where I'm not as concerned about it. Um, but on other machines, I do. <laughs> yeah. Although, realistically, I should probably just set up agent properly, but... Hmm. A uh, question from chat here. Is every app supervised by go crazy running as root? Yes. Uh, the default is your application start as root. Uh, you're expected to drop privileges yourself. Um, you can see this uh, in action, for example, with the NTP client that we have, which drops privileges. Um, there's a couple of other applications that do the same thing. Uh, it is going to be dependent on what it is specifically that you want to do. Like if you look at, for example, systemd service files, where you can also define like a lot of lockdown stuff. Uh, there's so much control surface for locking down your permissions, etc. Um, so that's why we don't want to get into it. We're just going to start your app as root, and then anything you need to do on top of that, you'll do yourself. Maybe we'll change that at some point in the future, but for now, that is the model. Mm -hmm. So I think that there might be just some little intric intricacy here with this, and like we can, I can look into this, I can fix it up and such. I just don't want to. Yeah. I'd like to figure out how to incorporate this properly into like the UI and such. I think it'd probably be a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? Yeah, for sure. So this seems to be it seems to be working to some extent. Cool. Yeah, it says it says the, it says I'm authorized even with identity dev null. That's strange. So maybe I, this I wonder. You know, I wonder if the dash i dev null is just like SSH starts looking and dev null doesn't find anything and folds back to your other key material. It could be. Yeah. Um. Let's try. Uh, one sec. Let me see. Okay, so I have some test key that I'm not using. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try that. Um, test ed25519. Yes. Yes. Still lets you in. Very strange. Um, you could also actually print the, the, the key, right? The SSH pub key that is authorizing width, just so that we can see that there is a difference. Like in the right. line 34, if you added like percent %v and printed key. Authorize percent %v percent %v. Okay, and then string key marshal, just really quick. Or maybe just key, actually. I think it might stringify to something nice. Uh, yeah, perhaps so, but I've already, I already wrote it, so I guess I'll just go with it, you know? <laughs> Let's see if that works. Yeah, so I think this might be, I think this might just be something with my SSH configuration versus, like, the code being wrong. I'm mm -hmm. not sure, but yeah. we'll, I can, I can look into this for sure. Okay, um, cool. right. Yes. ED25519. I mean, the thing is, my other key is ED25519 as well. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's why I meant, um, you know, maybe it, maybe instead of m doing the marshal, maybe just really print the the key, um, and or go oh, into so the code. you think it's a different, you think it's a different output? Mm -hmm, I think so. Okay, uh, let's try that. Yeah, sure. Why not? Um... Uh... 
right, just type conserve. Yes. Mm. It's like the same output. Indeed. All right, too bad. Um, maybe there is a method yeah. on it that you could call to actually get the fingerprint or something. I'm sure there probably is. Yeah. Um, you can also cat the uh, test ed25519 dot pub uh, in the terminal and see if anything in there is recognizable in the message. I don't have the public key apparently. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, mm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Why not percent %x? Yeah, I mean, I uh, this is something we can troubleshoot. I feel like we should probably not spend too much time on yeah. this right now. I yeah, mean, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I guess assuming we got the auth story worked out, which we will, um, yeah. how do we get this integrated properly into the distribution? Yeah, um, yeah, let's do that right now. So, um, yeah. I think this is package main, right? And like module yes, wise, this is package main. you have the go.mod like in your root, right? Um, so I, I think if you just go into your make file, and uh, in the list of packages that you're giving it, just append main. Oh, I think so the it, Go I think it's just called, main, the, the module's right? called, the module's oh, called conserve. Oh, oh, so, but then are we giving a module path here or an import path, right? And would they differ? Try conserve, see what happens. Okay. I was gonna say, cause what I, what I could do right now is like a namespace that says github.com slash empty layer as well, right, but. Right. Oh yeah, conserve. Uh, I think that should be like main should be the package that it looks up within the module. So we should be good, I think. Okay. Uh, so so just do a make again. Done, so we run make. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, let me. Uh... Doesn't look terrible yet. Cool. Well, looks promising. This is insanely cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, wait for the pings to come back. Yeah. And then at that point we can uh, yeah, see what happened. Yeah. Wow, this is, this is it's easy. It's really easy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I can make this daemon as simple or complicated as I want. Like I could do things like add Prometheus metrics, which I'm sure I will, but it's a- uh, For sure. Know. And sort of like an interactive shelf that you, know, you can use to do things in there. Always cool to have. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, cool. No, there you go. User conserve. Yeah. It, I don't think it prints anything yet, but uh, you could totally SSH into it, see if it works. Yeah, totally. Uh, SSH dash. Well, that command seems to work fine, so. All right. Woo. Starting serial connection. Uh, let's see here. Authorized true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's awesome. that's why we don't that's because we don't marshal right <laughs> yeah this is this is unbelievably cool yeah cool there you go there's your appliance yeah this is this this is uh this is how you create appliances on literally we literally started today and i had an empty sd card and none of these tools installed and we managed to get something that sets up an ssh connection piped into a serial console and got it installed using go crazy on a raspberry pi yeah this is awesome yeah, very cool. Um, so yeah, I think this is, uh, I have, this is definitely uh, have, a great experience. I have a little over ten minutes left, so I think uh, we're gonna open it up for for some Q and A, some more Q and A, I guess. Um, if definitely. you have any other questions or you know want to talk about anything else, uh, go crazy related, just let me know, um, and then we're gonna cut it once there's no more questions. But yeah, this is definitely the yeah. sort of experience that I was going for, right? Um, like. Yeah, now you can just iterate on your console server and not worry about the rest. Definitely. Yeah, I personally don't have any, I don't think I have any more immediate questions. I think now like a lot of this is just gonna come down to writing, you know, good Go code, secure Go code, et yeah. cetera. Yeah. But as far as like the environment, it all seems very straightforward actually. Um, mm -hmm. I actually did have a question about Go Crazy as a whole. So yeah. you've got some built-in services running here. Yeah. Do these things expose Prometheus metrics by default? Do any of them do that? Ooh, I don't think so. Um, no, I'm fairly sure okay. that none of them do. Um, and also, actually, if you remember earlier, um, when we, you did the first install, there was like a list of packages scrolling by and you were spotting your own package and we did not see Prometheus in there, right? So I don't think That's there's a like dependency yep. on, on Prometheus here. Uh, if you think about it, though, there's also not a lot that they do, right? Like the NTP stuff, yeah, maybe you want metrics about clock drift. Um, I don't know a lot about... Uh, I, I know basically how NTP works, but I don't know a lot about the details. So I wouldn't know if that would be easy to right. add um, or even reasonable to have. I don't know. 
the random D stuff, there's not a metric in there. Um, maybe if it worked, like if it got the perm random.c or no, but that would be, you know, that, that would be the only thing that comes to my mind. DHCP stuff, I don't know, you know more than me about this. Like, is there anything that a DHCP client should have a metric for? Lease expiration? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in theory, like, yeah, probably lease expiration, but also if the, uh, if you're sending like discovers and not receiving like any, like, requests for acknowledgements and such, you can indicate that there's some kind of problem with your DHCP setup. But in that case, if you can't reach DHCP, you probably can't get to the internet. So yeah, it's, uh, exactly, yeah. right? This is all like, you know, this is very basic stuff, right? Like NTP, DHCP, random seed, like none of these really, yeah. I mean, if they're gone, your connectivity is gone. Yeah, it's all extremely bare bones. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I guess the answer to that is no. Um, there was another question on the chat. Is there a list of things needed to add more devices to support go crazy? Would these be accepted if somebody created a PR? Um, why don't you, actually, why don't you switch to scene? And I'm going to drive this question. Definitely, yeah, happy to. Mm -hmm. um, actually, let me also then switch to scene. Cool. Uh, yeah, so there is a platforms here on gocrazy.org where you can see all of the supported platforms. Now, uh, you can see a couple of interesting things, right? There is the x86-64 QMU target that I mentioned earlier, which kind of covers all of the PCs, really. Um, so if you have anything that is not an embedded device, um, chances are it's already covered by this. And then in terms of Raspberry Pis, we support the Pi 3 and the Pi 4. Now, the Pi 3 was the only Pi that we supported when we started this project because it was the only Pi that was able to run the upstream Linux kernel, like not the Raspberry Pi Foundation kernel, but the upstream Linux kernel without any modifications, and was able to run in ARM64 mode um, by default. So that's like Go Crazy never did 32-bit. It only started out as like ARM64, both kernel and user land on the Pi 4. And... Um, like the you know in terms of in terms of work required, um, let me actually pull up GitHub go crazy go crazy. I think the issue was recently closed because we actually did all of the support stuff. Um, but yeah, this is the one I meant. Um, issue number forty eight. Um, add support for the Pi four B. You can get an uh, an impression of what I needed to fix in order to make the Pi four supported. It was largely uh, taking care of you know kernel configuration, uh, kernel changes that we need, um, but we also switched to partition UUIDs as part of adding support for the Pi 4 because they changed the order in which the MMC BLK0 device and BLK1 device were discovered. Uh, there was a network issue thing which we debugged for quite a while, boiled down to a different kernel parameter, etc. So the work, you know, it is doable, but it's going to take a while. So I would plan a couple of days um, if you were to make uh, go crazy run on a device on which it doesn't run today. Now, um, in terms of would support for these be accepted if somebody created PR, um, I'm a bit hesitant to to just say, oh yeah, I'm just going to accept everything, right? Because Part of the value proposition of Go Crazy is the auto update stuff and the device pipeline, right? And in fact, um, if you click on any of these, um, earlier Matt said that um, in the EEPROM, for example, we had like a couple of days old EEPROM version. Um, and the update actually is entirely automatically, like you can see that 10 days ago, our automation pulled in the new EEPROM version from 2020.06.15. Um, and that pull request, like if we open that up, we can see that it was entirely automatically. And there is just a limit to how many devices I can actually test on real hardware and run different versions of and take care of um, in terms of the support matrix, right? So when you start using Go Crazy, you get this application platform that is polished for the Pi 3 and the Pi 4, and that's really where all of the value is, right? Um, and if we were to, for example, the Odroid C2 that you mentioned in the chat, um, yeah, maybe it could be made to work, but I'm not going to run an Odroid C2 uh, in my closet and have it do the automated tests for gating new software releases. So you wouldn't get the full value proposition of Go Crazy. Now, depending on what it is that you want to do, maybe that's fine for you. Um, but I'm just saying like the the main restriction that we have on adding new platforms is that we don't have the capacity to do a lot of uh, QA for these different platforms, right? Like if there were people who were saying, Oh yeah, like I, I'm so bought into the Odroid C2, I have dozens of them, maybe out in customer sites, um, and 
that person would be willing to both run the Odroid C2 in a continuous integration pipeline that we could use to exercise it and also commit to fixing issues if there are issues, then maybe we can talk about this, right? That That's sort of the standard that I want to have here. So I don't want to tell people, oh yeah, you can run it on any of these 15 devices and then it turns out it doesn't work on half of them, right? It's, it's better to have a small set of really well-supported devices, I think. That's where I'm coming from right now. Um, and then other question was, is there anything special about default apps other than installing them by default? No, um, I, I don't think so. Um, there actually aren't that many default apps. Like the only default thing is like the, the go crazy um, DHCP, NTP and RandomD, right? Um, and you do need the, art, the, the NTP for setting the clock. As I mentioned, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have a clock that would survive the removing power and restoring power. Um, and you do need a DHCP for IPv4 connectivity. Uh, you don't necessarily need the random thing, though it is nice to have it uh, for better entropy across uh, restarts. But that's all of them. There's nothing special about them. It's just you need them. So that's why they're there by default. Anything else is not there by default. But yeah, there's nothing special. So if I wanted to have an IPv6 only uh, go crazy Raspberry Pi, I could just remove the DHCP demon. Exactly. Uh, yeah, let me actually the switch kernel, back the kernel to handles all the support for... Oh, no, no problem. You don't have to. Um, yeah, no worries. Just... I was done talking anyway. Oh, okay. Uh, there was actually a question in my chat as well. Would using buildroot.org to create kernels for unsupported devices? There might be missing a word there. Yeah, it looks like there's missing a word. Kernels. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't have, I haven't used buildroot myself. Um, I know vaguely what it does. Um, do you want to like clarify the question that you have? I'll keep an eye on the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is awesome. Makes things uh, so much easier than I would have anticipated for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh yeah, while we were waiting for uh, the person to clarify the question, actually let me um, showcase one more thing. Um, we have recently added these um, the user guide section here. Um, the quick start guide you've already seen, right? We've done this together on stream today. So we've done the instance creation, uh, overriding an SD card, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the user guide, there are a couple of um, standard use cases, so to say, like controlling a GPIO input output pin that deal with more of the sort of setup stuff that we did today, but for other use cases. So in here, um, you can see some code, some example code using the perf.io package, which works on Go Crazy. Um, and you can see that you know if you connect a multimeter here to the Raspberry Pi's pins, you can toggle them. Uh, you will see 3.3 volts, zero volts. That's like sort of the minimum to get an LED to light up, right? So if that is your thing, like if you have peripherals um, that need to be connected via GPIOs, um, that's how you would do it. We have a built-in remote syslog feature so that uh, you know as as the devices run stateless, uh, and you know if if you have updates enabled every day, uh, you would need to capture the log of the same day when you notice an issue. Like if you come home and the light doesn't turn on for some reason because your home automation is broken, you would need to fetch the logs immediately. And that's just kind of tedious uh, depending on you know what you're doing in your life. Um, so I figured logging it persistently is cool and I just log everything uh, to my workstation here. Um, it's very easy server side to set this up, just a couple lines into your server. Then we have TLS, which I mentioned earlier for uh, updates in untrusted networks. So if that is your thing, if you have a if you have a network setup where it would make sense to not just talk locally by HTTP, you can do it. Um, we recently also got Wi-Fi support only for unencrypted networks, though. So this is only good if the stuff that you run on top of Go Crazy is encrypted. So if you use like we did SSH, for example, if you enable TLS for your updates, um, maybe it is acceptable to have an unencrypted Wi-Fi. Unfortunately, Wi-Fi encryption is a little bit more laborious to set up. Like we would, you would need to write your own supplicant daemon uh, that doesn't use uh, C, right? Like you would need a, a native Go supplicant, uh, which is just you know a lot of work. Um, so this is like this is the the uh, the setup that we recommend for the time being. If you can't run a network cable, if you need to have it wireless, open a separate wireless network and only use it for this thing. And maybe with a MAC address filter so that your neighbors don't accidentally log into it. Um, this could work. I understand it's not for everybody, but there are limitations here. Um, any any more follow-up or questions from your chat, Matt? Yeah, actually. So here we go. Uh, looking at the work that went into porting to the Pi 4, I would imagine building a custom kernel for a specific device like Odroid is a fair bit of work. 
Since BuildRoot is intended to do just that and has support for many devices, I was wondering if it could help anyone wanting to do their own custom port. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, thank you so much for clarifying that question. That makes a lot more sense now. Uh, yeah, so it turns out actually building a kernel in GoCrazy is not that hard. Uh, in terms of commands, it's actually just like, uh, the, let me let me show you. So github.com slash go crazy slash kernel is the repository. And in the command directory, there is a go crazy rebuild kernel. If you just run that, it will just rebuild the kernel. Um, if you want to make any changes to the configuration, go into the build program itself. And there you can find like all of the config uh, stuff that we add to the Linux standard config. So as long as you know roughly what options you need, or as long as you prototype these options outside of GoCrazy, um, it will take you only a couple minutes to recompile it and then move it into GoCrazy. So I don't think it's worth like starting to get into build root just for the purpose of getting a working kernel. Uh, it is easy enough to get a working kernel both with the GoCrazy config outside of GoCrazy and then even compiling it within the GoCrazy system and just replacing it very easy as well. Um, so I would recommend you just try that first. Um, it should be fine for, for iteration as well. A couple of follow-ups. So uh, Jonathan, who asked the original question, says, well, that's neat. I agree. That's very neat. Uh, Taryn mentions, it's not too difficult to use GoCrazy with your own kernel. I had to do that while working on a kernel patch to fix my GoCrazy appliance. Interesting. Cool. Well, I'm glad to hear that you found it easy. Cool. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're pretty much on the mark. So if there's no other questions, um, I think... It's time for me to call it. Mm -hmm. I think I will probably hang out for, I could probably hang out for another half hour, hour and keep playing with this a little bit. Um, cool. So if folks want to hop over to my stream, I'm happy to do so. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you so much for your help today. This has been great. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to work uh, through this with you. Um, and I hope that it inspires some other people to try it at home maybe, um, or at least, you know, know that this is out there. Uh, give it a shot when you have an opportunity or a chance to do so. Um, let me know if you have any feedback or suggestions for improvements. Um, we can totally do some more streaming uh, on this subject and others. And I figured that if we're going to pick up router seven and work on router seven, um, all of the stuff that we've done today is going to be useful, right? Because it's built on the same platform. So this will come in handy. Mm -hmm. For sure. Cool. Great. Well, thanks again. Uh, I'm going to say bye bye. Um, thanks everyone for hanging out in the stream. Uh, see you soon. Yep. Later.